<clears throat> Alright, what's up guys? How's everybody doing? Welcome, 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 welcome to Classic Cast 24. We're here with Nano. Sorry, my voice is a little gone. Uh, in case you guys didn't see uh, my stream yesterday or my last video, uh, I think I was uh, I was being rather loud. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's kind of why my why my voice is a little scuffed up lately. But yeah, we're here with our friend Nano, uh, quality assurance lead, team lead for Nost, and uh, we are very very excited to have him here. Uh, we were actually we we had planned on having him on before the most recent classic news uh, because we wanted to talk about a lot of the differences between private servers and uh, between private servers and retail vanilla, which is something that's actually been discussed quite a bit, right? We've been talking about that since yeah. uh, since before. Yeah, yeah, I mean, since since before the the announcement, even it's like okay, yeah, like you're playing on private servers, and people say all the time, it's like okay, well, I, I experienced this game. Or whenever, whenever I last experienced this game, right? Whenever I played in vanilla, it's like this worked like this, this worked like that, and this is how we're doing it on private servers. Uh, and, and that discussion is really even uh, it, it's it's picked up a lot recently, and it's it's been growing constantly since the announcement. So again, I'm here with Stay Safe TV with Tips Out Baby. If you guys haven't followed them yet, you definitely should. Uh, and of course, our our guest Nano. Nano, what have you been up to since the last time that we had you on? Um, I've been playing video games, living my life. Uh, there you go. <laughs> selling copiers <laughs> there you it's go. exciting man it's exciting i grew up wishing to do that all my life and now i, got, I finally got to do it so mm -hmm. that's good there there you go. that's, that's 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 most kids dream most kids yeah. dream growing up yeah, is, yeah. Is i didn't want to be a baseball player or a football player or anything like that it's like <laughs> give me a kind of coming i'll be happy yeah, there you go. I just want to bring this up because it's so cool. But after Nostalgia shut down, Blizzard had you as well as some other Nostalgia members go out to Blizzard HQ in case anyone in chat didn't know that. True. And they, mm -hmm. they talked to you about Vanilla WoW and sort of how you guys pulled off Nostalgia, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, so some of the fun stuff that's come out since we last talked is um, Ithacens was, was sharing a little bit about like he didn't know that they had started working on Classic and then found out later. And it seemed like the timeline was either slightly before we were invited to, to Blizzard to talk or slightly after we had our conversation mm -hmm. at, at, um, at the HQ. So it's, um, it's, it's cool to see that uh, everybody is, you know, it, we're at where we're at right now where we've gotten Classic news and we're like yeah. getting closer to the, uh, to the, Launch point. It's it's crazy. It's fun. Oh yeah. I mean, like we we know within six months we'll be playing full release classic WoW. Maybe as soon as four months. Like right. we're getting mm -hmm. we're getting really close, man. And we, yeah. we've already we've already waited seventeen months, right? So yeah. And to put to put the four months line. to put the four months into context, it's been over four months since BlizzCon. So there's a chance mm -hmm. that there might be less time between now and classic than there was between now and BlizzCon. Mm -hmm. It's also yeah. been over four months since I've talked to a girl. So, uh, yeah, that's that's how it goes. That's mm -hmm. true. But that's mm -hmm. like less time than usual, right? Yeah. Uh, less less yeah, time less... than most of the people in the chat right now, for sure. But yeah, <laughs> yeah let's, let's just go with that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, anyway, no, so, so yeah, I think that was really good. Stay safe, bring that back up again. Uh, because not everybody watches every episode of Classic Cast. Uh, but, yeah, whenever we had Nano on last time, we, we talked about how uh, they went out to Blizzard HQ and, and they got a chance to meet with the devs. And it is really cool to, to kind of hear all the stories. And I had this realization when we had Yithesons on uh, last week. Or, or two weeks ago, whenever uh, whenever he was kind of explaining the timeline, and I think it's so cool to go back and to piece everything together right. after the fact. You're like, wait, so oh, yeah. whenever Nano did this, like it was just like, poof, it was great. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. When 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 Ethan was talking about that, the impression I got when listening to it um, was that they had been working on Classic like at least six months prior to flying you guys out. Is yeah. am I remembering correctly? Yeah, it's it's possible. Um, I think so like which would make it a lot, a lot more sense right why oh, yeah. yeah they invited us out um now i don't know about six months because we we shut down in in april and we were shut down technically in like march mm -hmm. and then we actually finally shut down in april and then we went out that summer which is like less than six months mm -hmm. but okay um m maybe Maybe they were working on Classic before we got shut down and then invited us to be a part of the process anyway. But maybe we were just part of the... Like, they had a lot of questions about how we developed it, the back end of working, like how we got how much population on the servers as we did. Like, they had a lot of those questions, so. Yeah, I, I love all that. I think I think that's great. Um, so, 
Uh, let's let's go ahead and start talking about. Uh, I, I know, like I said, the the original reason uh, we thought NOS or Nano would be such a good fit for uh, this show is talking about a lot of the differences of the private servers with NOS um, and and what was retail vanilla. But we had such big news yesterday. Uh, finally, you got okay. I think everybody who watches Classic Cast is going to be so excited to finally stop hearing <laughs> about only having four phases of content release. So yes, it was finally confirmed. Okay, finally confirmed. They uh, they decided that they're going to increase it from four to six phases. So big claps in the chat. Good job, everybody. We yeah. did it. Yeah, pop, pop the Red Bulls. It's all good. You, you so, rose up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, dude, I, I, I was so like... Uh, I okay. I was literally about to go to bed because I'd been up all night. I, I I drove back to Austin from Dallas, and my my Discord and everything starts popping off like while I'm getting ready to sleep, and I'm like, dude, I I, I was like, I I I, I totally just nerdgasm. Just it was it was a uh, it was a lot. Yeah. So I, I was super super excited about that, and um, let's go ahead and talk about what that really means, right? Let's talk about what that really means to, to actually go from four to six phases uh, in yeah. a nutshell, kind of like broadly, and then and then we'll go down into each phase and uh, what we think about it. Stay safe, do you want to start? Well, yeah, like the, 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 the two big differences here are that Dire Maul will not be in phase one with Molten Core and Anixia, which is very, very big. Uh, as they said in their blue post, Dire Maul, a lot of the gear mm -hmm. is better than Molten Core gear, and that would serve to make Molten Core an early progression a lot easier. And then also mm -hmm. splitting up um, Zulgrub and PW Well. Zulgrub has a lot of really good cast gear as well for as, as well as other gear, and the enchants, which are really good, which would make um, BW Well progression easier for a lot of guilds. That's the biggest change. What do you guys think about it? I mean, definitely. Like, mm -hmm. uh, from a pure gameplay perspective, I agree 100%. Uh, the two biggest things I took away from it, kind of beyond the gameplay, was, number one, it means that Blizzard is clearly listening. Mm -hmm. um, the suggestions of the six stages was something we all pushed here on Classic Cast. Mm -hmm. uh, as so many people pushed for it on YouTube, on, on the forums, on Reddit. Uh, so it definitely showed that Blizzard was listening. And mm -hmm. almost more importantly than that, I think it showed that Blizzard is willing to take the harder way uh, rather than just the easy way out. Um, six mm -hmm. stages means more overhead for Blizzard. It means um, they have to you know, test more patches as they roll them out. Um, it means they have to moderate these patches as they go live with more people, I'm guessing. Uh, it's just, it's the more expensive route. And I think for a lot of people, the fear about Classic was uh, especially after we heard about the loot sharing and stuff like that, was Blizzard going to take the easy, financially friendly way out? And uh, mm -hmm. I, I think, if anything, yesterday's post confirmed that, no, they're willing to spend the extra dime to make sure it's mm -hmm. more authentic and uh, closer to vanilla as it was back in the day. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, at this mm -hmm. point, I have no doubt that they sincerely, genuinely want to recreate Classic WoW or recreate vanilla WoW in Classic WoW as closely as they possibly can. Like, right. I, I really think they're sincere with that goal. Yeah. Well, when we got a chance to... Uh... Just to, just to add on to that, when we got a chance to actually meet some of these guys, right? When we got a chance to meet uh, Brian and Omar at BlizzCon. I mean, these are guys who actually worked on the original like Vanilla WoW team, right? These are guys who worked on Vanilla WoW, uh, you know, from from or back in the period of time between 2004 and 2006, and they really care. Like, it's something that's important to them is to is to make the game right. Uh, and even like even John Height, who's who's Jalen, he has Jalen Brack's old position with WoW. He wasn't there with whenever whenever Vanilla was active, but he was a fan of the game, and and he's somebody who like the way the vibe that I got from him is like he has like full trust in like in in, in those guys to be able to recreate the game as closely as possible. Nana, what do you think? How, how did you feel about it? Yeah, I thought it was great. Um, a lot of things that, like Stay Safe mentioned about you know. I care a lot as a player. I want the game to be balanced as we go along. Um, my fear with having Dire Maul available at release is that some of the power levels would then shift where you can just skip some raid items as upgrades. You don't have to worry about those because you can just be satisfied with the, the slightly or evenly good item from Dire Maul uh, mm. or just the straight upgrade from Dire Maul, like things like you know, Padre's Trousers and Ogre Magi mm. Staff and, and those kind of items. Those are really, really strong early game. and mm. uh, So especially Dire, Dire Maul early and then also bound, like spreading out the, the length between you know, the world bosses and um, Zolgarub and uh, Zolgarub not landing at the same spot as BWL. It definitely means, at the very least, that the 
the caster's level power level are gonna is gonna go down significantly. Like the loss mm-hmm. of blood fine is a big deal, but also there's a lot of great melee weapons and healer healer items that are available in soul grub as well. So as far as like the the item balance and making the raids feel worthwhile, um, that was a really important thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I knew. And, and on top of that, it just helps to recreate the actual vanilla WoW timeline, which is what I think people want with classic WoW. As, you know, with within reason. Right. Well, and that's something that they have done on private servers, right? They they've gone through and they've phased content together and they've packaged it together. Right. Where, um, you know, for example, the the launch patch for most private servers is one point two. Uh, where it's like, okay, you know what, Mardon came out a few weeks after release. It makes sense in the in the natural progression of things to have a level forty dungeon, a uh, level forty range dungeon inside the game at uh, at launch, right? So you'll have one point two in the game. Uh, on the flip side of things, on the back end of it, one point twelve. Like, there's things that change in every patch, but some patches have like a content release, and other ones don't, right? And with one point twelve, like they added in the cross realm battlegrounds, and basically we're preparing the game for Burning Crusade. So it doesn't really make sense to have that release on its own. Packaging that with uh, the the uh, Nax patch makes sense. It's natural. So uh, I, I think it's uh, it's something that's. Uh, we we thought it was going to happen. We literally we actually talked about it before they announced it. We we're like, well, we could see them doing it like this. So <clears throat> cool to see that they're that, that it feels like they're listening. They're doing things the right way. Uh, splitting up Dire Mall, splitting up ZG away from the the raids. Because one thing that happens, actually, one thing that happens um, in the progression of Vanilla WoW is that they release a raid tier. They release content. And then they release content after the fact that's easier than the content they've already released, but it's treated as a natural catch-up mechanic to people who maybe have have come to the game and are new to the game. Maybe they're rolling an alt. Maybe uh, it's something to do on the side. And what's really, really good about this content that they add, whether it's Dire Maul being five-man content or ZG being 20-man content that gives blues, despite the fact that you've had BWL and MC out at this point and Anixia and World Bosses, um, <clears throat> it's that there's other things that you can get in ZG that are valuable to even the, the top end raiders who are you know pushing BWL and all this other stuff. So what happens is the top end raiders are going to want to group with people who may be rolling an alt or somebody who's new to the game uh, who needs like all the crappy gear that like you know the the, the little pieces and then they get the big pieces and it, it just it's a natural cycle of uh, right. getting everybody geared out and content for everybody. Yeah, so exactly. that, that's very good. The way they balanced. I'm sorry. Now go ahead. I was going to say, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, the way they balanced uh, a new catch-up content for both the hardcore and the casual player was something that I don't think has been done since Vanilla, at least not that well. Uh, like s said, like ZG, like even the most hardcore players are going to want to go into ZG, and even the most casual players want to go into ZG. And it's a very, very great balancing act. And I want to go back to what s said just a little bit earlier mm-hmm. about, um, you know, Dire Maul serving as a catch-up mechanic. My biggest concern with Dire Maul coming out at launch, aside from the power gains, was the disruption of like the progression curve in vanilla. Mm-hmm. Like in vanilla, like there's a very steady linear progression as you go along. And um, if you put Dire Maul or catch up raids earlier on than they were intended to be, all of a sudden you take away weight and value from the previous content, the raids that were supposed to be there instead, and you start to accelerate people on the progression curve so it no longer feels natural, it feels disjointed. And uh, it's kind of like an intangible concept, but you know when you're in it, when you're experiencing it. Like, basically, the way they have it now, you're always going to feel like you're growing in every single stage, in every single patch. You're never going to feel like you're experiencing content that trivializes other content. Right. Mm -hmm. What what I was going to say is, like, the one of the big differences between classic and the current bfa game is that there's no expectation in classic to be fully bis unless you had like a really mm-hmm. really long time to farm the content so like you're in molten core you're in Ixia for a while most likely not all of your melee are going to be able to have gotten an onslaught girl and the band of Acuria by the time that bwl comes out and mm-hmm. so when you start adding in Dire Maul, then you can fill some more of those slots. So it just like increases the power level of the whole raid by a substantial amount. So it's not that the items themselves are that great, it's that the items themselves are um, a lot more accessible that each individual player can expect to have that item. So like Tarnish Elven Ring is a really great ring for melees and hunters. And so having the ability to have every melee have those two things 
relatively easily, just running five mans, makes the you know the power level of everybody improve significantly. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. that that's really the difference is because ZG is so much more accessible than BWL, and Dire Maul is so much more accessible than MC, and you know even later, which we'll get to probably now is progressive itemization where the 110 mm -hmm. items increases are so much more accessible than a Q. And so being able to increase everybody's power level from easy gear, um, you know, really makes a big difference if you hold it back. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree with everything you guys said. I think that this is a very, very good start. In my mind, there are two issues uh, with this current timeline that still need to be addressed. And you just brought one of them up, progressive um, itemization. So they've talked about not adding certain items until one until 110. Right. Um, but certain items need to be updated prior to that or at that point items changed a lot like items right. that were in the game earlier changed several times and so there's there's that progressive organization has yet to be talked about and then mm -hmm. also <clears throat> the pvp system um if you look at their mm -hmm. pr new proposed phases list it says tba so and i think that's actually wise because i think this is something that they probably need feedback on they need to hear um what people want and and just think about it more probably because you know for, for those of you that don't know for the first four months of vanilla wow there was no pvp system you couldn't rank, um, there were no battlegrounds, you couldn't rank up 1 to 14. And then in patch 1.4, they added, yeah, 1.4, they added the honor system. And so you could start ranking, but it wasn't for another two months that they added battlegrounds. And so this mm -hmm. two month period prior to battlegrounds, but after the PvP system was introduced, this was the era of, you know, Tarn Mill versus South Shore and World PvP and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, I would really like kills. <laughs> what would have been dishonorable kills too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I want to know what you guys think about that. I made a video talking about this this morning. I really want to see the PVP system added in, um, in phase two with more, uh, sorry, with Dire Maul, Azagos and Kazakh, which is going to be a very big world PVP phase anyway, because now you have two world boss PVP objectives. Now you have Dire Maul, which is crazy for world pvp and then you know a couple months later battlegrounds being added with blacking layer that's what i would like to see yeah. Just sort of replicate that feeling yeah. i yeah. think uh, i think that uh i think that would be a really good way to approach it if they wanted to split up the introduction of the honor system and the release of battlegrounds uh i think that would probably be the best way to do it i think you're right i think i think that was a really good thing um if they don't let's say they don't want to do that right if they wouldn't want to do that I think that if they put it in with phase two with Dire Maul, or if they put it in between Dire Maul and Blackwing Lair, I think that would work as well. But I, I agree with you. I think I think you saying that they should split it up between two and, and three would probably be the best way to do it. So I, I advocated for that on Twitter yesterday and then thought about it more. And um, I've changed our minds on that. Mm -hmm. And mostly it's based on the type of player that's going to be playing this game like mmo players are much more sophisticated they're going to min max at a much larger scale like mm -hmm. torrent mill and south shore was not a very efficient way to get honor and it just wasn't right. you know what right. the most efficient way to get honor without battlegrounds is farming flight points and burning steeps yeah uh, or or winter spring or that's what that's like actually that's actually why we started the paladin police force stuff is because we would go police the flight points to, <laughs> to kill people who are ganking people yeah right so that's my fear is that you know by eliminating bgs then you're going to incentivize people to farm flight points and so mm. you're really rewarding people to hit 60 faster and those people who were slower and taking their time in the the, the leveling system they're just going to get pounded once they hit level 48 and level 50 in those leveling zones uh, at the flight points. And that's just not great for the health of the server long term. Yeah, I mean, have people being like shoved down as they're trying to level. Keep in point. mind, though, you know, the PvP system, even without Battlegrounds, would not be added until, you know, month four or five, right, in that time frame. So that's that's a lot of time. You're right. People do level slowly, but that is a lot of time. Um, there would still be people leveling. I think that people, you know, if this is happening, you know, you're going to have world defense channels. People are going to say, you know, don't fly here. There's someone camping this guy. Or, you know, p p players can be very reactionary to, to stuff like that. Yeah. You, mm -hmm. you definitely open the door to having that type of meta gameplay, uh, meta faction gameplay. Um, I, I, that would be my that would be my concern if I was on the design team and yeah. making this decision to be splitting these two up. Like, what are the ultimate ramifications of that? Like, are the pros of 
having that availability and that meta, you know, PvP system available is that better than than the feelings of the players who are decide that they're just going to not level until BGs come out because all the gankers are going to go away. Is like which of those is better? Which is you know bet, like healthier for the stuff? So, so out of curiosity, is that why you guys decided to release BGs at launch for NOS? Was that your kind of thinking? Because NOS was a little bit different. You, you did release BGs at launch. You didn't put it later on uh, in the game. And um, a lot of private servers have done that since. And I think even before NOS, if my memory serves me correctly. But what was the rationale behind that? So um, I wasn't part of the launch team for NOST. I joined like a couple months right when Dire Maul was being released on NOST. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't know the full uh, like plan of, of why they had BGs at the beginning. Most likely because they didn't consider that it wasn't in the beginning. Um, and the other thing in the private server community, there's a lot of uh, PvP heroes, for lack of a better term, who want <laughs> to be able to get to rank 14 ASAP so they can get their best in slot weapons before BWL is even out and mm -hmm. just out gear everybody like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are also the loudest people on forums and discords and that kind of <laughs> stuff. And so it's very possible that they just didn't want to deal with the personalities and, and just, you know, just kind of dealt with it. Yeah. yeah. True. Yeah. Like, you, know, you can have your battlegrounds. It's fine. Yeah. So, so I think um, one thing to that point is how the private server meta is different from the vanilla meta and that's all that it's going to be different from the classic meta and uh the private server meta of pvp uh the progression was a lot more linear whereas in retail vanilla you had pvp as an alternative method for being able to gear up your character you could either pvp and you could gear up your character there or you can pve and you can raid and and, and do all that and some people would do both but it wasn't treated the same way that it's treated on private servers whereas uh people go and they they rush rank 14 and they'll do split runs and they might even go and uh they might even raid around the reset where some of the most hardcore guilds what they'll do is let's say reset is on tuesday so they would raid monday night and they would raid tuesday night and then they would grind on it for two weeks and then they would raid two nights in a row every two weeks um that was one method that, that people would use whenever they're trying to get as many people rank 14 as possible so that you have as many GM weapons or, or High Warlord weapons in the raid by the time Blackwing Lair comes out. Right. I don't think that's that, – that's not the way the game was initially intended to be played, but that's the way that some of these speedrunning guilds and whatnot played on private servers. Right. Uh, we've talked about that before. I, I, don't, I, I don't think that's particularly healthy for the game for it to be um, – for that to be the way to play the game. Um but to not have PvP until the Blackwing Lair patch, uh, that's the opposite way, basically, of doing it. Where it's like, okay, now all of a sudden, like, nobody can get anything before BWL. And there might not be enough content for those PvPers for, who knows, maybe six, seven months until Blackwing Lair comes out. So, yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm going through puberty. I know I said no changes. I know I said no changes, okay? But we're having some changes today. So, hey. <laughs> But uh, but no, the, the idea that uh, that Stay Safe proposed in his video, uh, I'm assuming this is the idea in the video because uh, we've talked about it before. But um, of splitting up the PvP system instead of just bringing the entire PvP system, the Honor System plus BGs, into one stage, divide it up as it was back in vanilla, release the first part of of the PvP package, which is just the Honor System as a whole, release that in phase two with Daramal, Azure Ghost, Kazak. And then save the second half, which is the battlegrounds themselves, for phase three with BWL. And uh, that replicates the vanilla process a lot more. The honor system was introduced in patch 1.4, and BGs were introduced in patch 1.5, so it more mimics vanilla. And at the same time, it does allow for that Terran Mill versus South Shore memory that so many people have heard about, so many people have seen videos of, but never got to experience. Uh, I think it's really important to preserve, you know, mm -hmm. Of all the events in vanilla, that's definitely one of the ones that I think a lot of people really want to see again. Yeah, I, I, I think you're really right. I think even if it's not the most, you know, min-max way to farm, I think people will still do it. Um, people will still organize giant events. So let, let's say they don't split it. Let's go opposite direction. Let's say they don't split mm -hmm. it and they add the PvP system and Battlegrounds either in Phase 2 or Phase 3. So let's say they add it in Phase 2. Um, so Phase 2... The, I think the biggest concern with that is that um, you'll have Battleground reputation rewards. So you'll have Ultruck Valley rewards. You can get exalted in literally, you know, like five or yeah. six days, less than that uh, with Ultruck Valley. 
and um, you know, Warsong Gulch as well. So you'll have people that are exalted with Warsong and uh, Altruck Valley by the time BWL is out, and that would mm -hmm. also compromise some BWL gear. So yep. I, I, yep. I think not adding it in phase two is a smart move. So let's say you add it in phase three. Um, one thing I've seen a lot of people complain about with having a later PVP release is you're not going to have PVP trinkets, which are very, very it's helpful in, in a yeah. lot of situations. So I think, I really think that they should split it. I really think that's the best solution here. Uh, I mean, in, in a perfect world, right? In a perfect world, you could even have it to where they split it and then they don't even release all the battlegrounds at the same time. Right. But I, I'm not so sure that they would do that. No, that would be great. I, I, would, I would love for them to do that. And I don't see, honestly, I don't see why they couldn't do that, to, to be completely honest. Well, they could. And, you know, like, let, let's, so how it happened in Vanilla WoW, it was Warsong Gulch, All Truck Valley that came out first together uh, right. with 1. 1.5. 1. Yep. And then and then later on was added Arathi Basin. So let's say they added, let's let's say they split it three ways, right? Let's say you have Honor System added phase two, and then Warsong Gulch, Altrek Valley phase three, and Arathi Basin, which Arathi Basin's rewards are probably the best of all of them. I think AB has some really good uh, Exalted rewards and, and even like Honor Revered rewards. Yeah. Let's say they add that phase four with Zulgur up. And that works because phase four, yeah, ZG, and, and Arathi came in 1.7. So mm -hmm. it actually right. kind of lines up perfectly. They wouldn't have to change yeah. anything and their face schedule, it's all right there. Yeah. So I, think, I, hmm. I would actually advocate for slipping in a seventh phase where it's just the PvP edition phase yeah. in, in between Dire Maul and Blackwing Lair. Um, so we don't know how much time length is going to be between these different phases. It'll probably vary between what's what it's doing, but um, I would I would fit in like the honor system as its own update in between those two phase two and phase three as we have it now. Um, it, like if you do it four weeks before Blackwing Lair is going to come out, there's not going to like you will get offhands and the AV rewards available because mm -hmm. um, uh, I would be putting honor and BGs together. Um, but mm -hmm. you won't have access to the rank seven to ten or the rank fourteen gear until well into BWL's release. So yeah. that's mm -hmm. kind of how I would I would slot it in. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a concern is having people, uh, you know, rank 12, 13, 14 going into BWL. I think right. they should really make a point to avoid that. Right. Well, I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily impossible back in the day, right? Because because you had 1.4 patch came out and then you didn't have BWL until 1.6. So you could have had some people Now you I couldn't have like was, a whole roster of rank 14 warriors. Exactly. Yeah, so it would have it would have been possible technically at exactly three months, right? Because yeah. it's it's twelve yeah. weeks. Just yeah, it's so. twelve weeks if you're if you're bracket one every week. Mm -hmm. Now is, is it was it likely? I mean, people didn't understand the brackets and stuff back then, but yeah. um, surely I, I don't know. I mean, I, I wonder who the first ever rank fourteen was. That'd be that'd be interesting to find out. Yeah, well, um, actually, yeah. So it was it was me yeah, coming yeah. soon to a tips uh, chat video. <laughs> <There you go>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like just first question, what's wrong with you? <laughs> what kind of problems do you have? <laughs> right. Oh, How much did it cost you when you dropped out of college? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no. I, the the big unforeseen condition now is the duration of the phases. Like you were saying, twelve weeks. Like, what is the spacing now? I think most of us speculated that in, in the original plan it was going to be six months now you look at it you have six phases over a 24 month period is it going to be four months each are they going to make certain phases longer than others are they planning to balance the phases around retail wow content patches yeah I, I I don't think each phase should be the same length I mean for example like phase five which is the AQ phase should not be as short as phase four or phase two, right. which is Dire Mons will grab, right? Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. let's say phase two and phase four are like two months, you know, phase five might need to be five or six months. Yeah. Yeah. I, that would, and that would be about right. Cause uh, I think it was, I think it was six months because it came out in January of 2006 back in the day. And then um, uh, it's either July. June or July. It's July, July 11th, right? For the, for the next patch. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. Um, I think it makes a little. I think it makes sense to have that phase longer anyway, because you have to do the gate opening and whatnot. Now, now the gate opening is going to probably happen a lot faster uh, than it did back in the day because people are going to be prepared for that. And true, well, we I don't mean, know. That it could it can go both ways. You're it could change. That's the thing. It could change, but you also might have people that are intentionally delaying it to farm uh, uh, the, re the the black crossy resonating crystals, right? Mm -hmm. Farm the mounts, right? Mm -hmm. And we, when we've seen that before too. By the way. 
<laughs> yeah, like I mean, you'll see like sometimes you'll have like the top guilds on the server essentially like hold it hostage. Yeah, and they'll they'll yeah. talk and they they go through and they say, okay, we're gonna do this and we're gonna hold off so we can get as many mounts as possible. Now I, I don't remember the exact story. I uh, this was whenever I was on Illidan. This was whenever I was on Illidan at the time, and um, I, I don't remember all the details, so I won't go into it too much. But there was some drama on Illidan about how uh, they basically were planning to ring the gong at the same time, and then somebody went rogue, and they they uh -huh. uh, I think it was Pic I think it was Piccolo. Maybe Piccolo went rogue and rang the gong before he was supposed to, and then somebody ended up not getting the mount because of it because there's like a six hour window. Right. Um, or was it the other guy? Maybe it was the undead. Uh, I don't remember what class he played. But yeah, either way, like there was there was some drama about that in the past. I know on Illidan server, um, so yeah, or ten hour window maybe. I don't know. I, I can't remember the exact numbers, yeah, ten but hour. Um, <clears throat> ten hour window. So yeah, the uh, it's it's very very uh, very possible actually that that happens. So uh, hopefully that's one, not the case. One other thing that we we talked about pro progressive itemization and when it comes to the blue PvP sets that matters a lot too. It's like what t what version of the blue PvP sets are they going to make available because yeah. the second set which was mm -hmm. changed in the max patch uh, well, so the original one the original one was you know 1.5 or 1.4 or whatever it was but they changed they updated the blue sets to be really good in the max patch 1.11 which is a really long time away and by that point everybody basically who was going to get them anyway had already gotten something better um but like what version do they go with? Do they go with the Nax level ones where you can like skip a yeah. lot of BWL items because mm -hmm. you have, especially for casters, like you can kind of get away with not getting Mission Dares and Blackwing Cabal because you have head, shoulder, two piece, and that's better. Um, mm -hmm. If they have that available, then you know that's going to change how the gear works in in the uh, BWL, or, or maybe they'll update it when it comes or whatever it is. Um, so. It, that's a question I have to answer too, because yeah. it changes the balance of of raid gear. There's that. So yeah, originally there was the level 58 blue PVP sets that uh, later on became right. level 60. It was a, it was it wasn't that they changed the items. It was an entirely new set. They stopped right. offering the 58 gear and then added new level 60 right. blue gear. And uh, also on top of that, they at one point I, I I think I actually thought it was later, but uh, we were looking at some web archive stuff. I, was it 1.6 that they reworked or re-itemized? The epic PvP says I thought it was like 1.9, but the the weapons they they changed in 1.6. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the weapon um, the weapons got changed earlier to yeah. to match the BWL weapons. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But also also at a certain point they added more weapons, right? Because there wasn't like a caster yes. maze and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So they added more weapons. They re That's the Max patch. Next patch. But yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they added like the spell blade and an offhand and a number of other things. That was yeah. all the way at the next patch. Mm -hmm. So TLDR the PvP stuff changed a lot. And just right. waiting until 110 to do it or like phase five, um, I'm not sure if that would be adequate. And it, it's it's actually bigger than just the PvP items. We need to talk more about progressive itemization because so many items changed. I mean, let's talk about Bone Reaver's Edge. It changed like six times throughout Vanilla Wire. It changed a ton, yeah. There's yeah, a lot like that changed. And uh, I, I think just waiting till phase five or whatever it is that they wanted to do would just be too long yeah. for some yeah. of these items. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, can, can we get a quick summary, S. Fand, of uh, of what exactly they talked about when it comes to progressive itemization? What what exactly did they say? Yeah, so so basically, in in this last article, the main thing that they touched on is the fact that there are items that change later on in the game, uh, namely in the one point ten patch, they add items like Heart of Warmth Lock or Warmth Alec or however you pronounce it, and LBRS stuff like that, um, blue items that are added to dungeons. So that's really the only thing they touched on. However, throughout the entire course of Vanilla, uh, there are items added to to different dungeons. Um, I think it's like Reanimated Chain Necklace. I think it's the name of it. The the healing necklace in. Uh, in Strath Undead and Baron's side that drops off Ramstein. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, not, not to get too much into specifics there, but there's items that are added at every point, but the 1.10 patch is considered one that is, uh, like, they, they basically did, like, a big revamp. Um, there's different parts to pro progressive itemization, right? There's times where, like, they add new items, there's times where they update items, and... Uh, this happens all the way throughout vanilla so for them to go through and actually look at every single item specifically and uh, To see when things update I think is uh, I don't think it's gonna happen to get like true progressive organization Especially because we're into phases now and then they'd have to like package stuff together or whatever But I do think there's some big points uh, like the PvP weapons for example or like the PvP gear excuse me um, That if they have all the best PvP gear in from the beginning 
or as soon as PvP is a thing, then it, it might not necessarily be a good thing because it might just be way too strong. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, I think we're definitely like off off to the right start, like saying that okay, well, we're gonna add these items in later, so these items aren't in that are supposed to be in at the end of the game. So that's that's basically what they talked about. That's what's like confirmed so far. So like one one. Mm -hmm like weird example of, of how this works. So they talk about like changing drop tables, right? Mm -hmm. To fit how they were in those patches. So in the original Molten Core, both tier one and tier two pieces dropped off of Molten Core bosses. And then uh, later when they added new items to the Molten Core loot tables, which is patch 1.4, they removed the tier twos out so they would slot them in for Blackwing Lair. And so and then later made those tier two items significantly better than the tier ones. So we don't know how they're going to do that here, right? Are they going to have the um, the MC loot tables as they ended up being a 1.5? So they added items in 1.4 and 1.5. Are they going to have that as the new MC? Are they going to have tier two as part of the drops and then change the mm -hmm. item stats? Like, there's a lot of questions that they have to answer on that. The easiest mm -hmm. path in my mind is that you make the 1.5 items in MC available at the launch. Uh, you don't have to change drop tables anymore. That's the only, you know, and that will include items like Mana Igniting Core, Talisman of Ethereal Power, um, Quick Strike mm -hmm. Ring. Mm -hmm. um, items that are good for yeah. like almost all of vanilla. Uh, Benediction, Ancient Petrified Leaf, mm -hmm. like the items off of Domo, because until 1.4, Domo had no items at all. Um, and I also think that my guess is that at the end of the day, they're going to have, at the very least, like tier items have their final stats and not update their stats over the course of the the game, uh, just because that's too much micro work that they're gonna be putting themselves through to update. Yeah, um, I do. I do think that's a pretty yeah. that's a pretty big. I, I I think that's pretty big if they start putting in all of, all those items in from that point instead of like right before BWL. Um, but I also think you're right about saying that it's it ends up being a lot of like little changes that they have to make later on. So I don't know. I don't know how they approach it. I, I think it's um, it's definitely something that affects the game. But is it something that's going to hurt the game uh, if it's if it's in from the beginning? That's something like right. you'd really have to sit down and think about. Well, yeah. if you, um, like if you have tier two early, and then in order to fill in the drop table gaps of not having the 1.4 1.5 items then you're going to change right. the too and if you don't have them in and you don't have the 1.4 1.5 items then mm -hmm. there are still some really good items like a uh, band of Acuria that's going to drop true. like 40 percent of the time whenever you kill rag because there's just not enough items in the drop table to even that out so the, there's yeah. those things you have to really figure out like what's what's the best option for them as a design side and for right. the balance side for players so so you made a really good point right there talking about how there used to be tier 2 and mc because it was 1.4 whenever they took the tier 2 gear out of mc and uh some of the gear so okay let's explain this for people who don't know uh originally whenever wow came out there was tier 2 gear available in molten core and in the 1.4 patch, they took this out and then they reworked it a little bit and then they saved it to reintroduce it in Blackwing Lair. Uh, so you could get, as a paladin, you could get both the Judgment gear and the Lawbringer gear. Um, <clears throat> I think to, I think to have that would be really cool, right? But more than likely, they won't have that, especially because the Judgment gear, the original Judgment gear for paladins, and then I'm speaking from my own personal thing, um, was insane like it was a, it was a rep paladin set it was awesome like a chance on like 20 percent chance whenever you crit that you do like a, a holy damage pro it was great it was amazing um and then they made it suck and they made it like a pvp healing set uh and and whatever they whenever they took it out and then they re-released it in blackwing layer in 1.6 it was a pvp healing set and then in 1.9 they made it to where the Paladin set was reworked to be more of a spell power plate set, like more of a shock it in type of set, like spell power ret maybe uh, some of the pieces. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I know I, I they made it good. It was actually insanely good PvP healing set. But I, for me, it sucked, right? Um, for me, it would have sucked, I should say, uh, if I had it. So, um, yeah, the... Um, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought there, but my, my, my basic point is... Uh, you make a really good point about if they take that stuff out and they don't have that in and they don't replace it with anything else, they uh, make the rewards for Molten Core a lot a lot weaker overall if they don't have the 1.5 stuff in. Because they took it out in 1.4 and then they put they, they, they filled it back in in 1.5. Yeah, in, 1 in retail vanilla. 1.5, yeah. 
Oh, that's true. Actually, yeah. there's some things yeah. in 1.4 as well. That's true. What, one of my so. concerns with like them changing uh, itemization too much, I mean, of course, things need to change, but changing it too much. And I'll use the example of the BRE again, because it changed like six times and there happens to be like six content phases. So right. like it would change like every content phase pretty much uh, for it to <laughs> you know, keep with pace. Um, yeah. I, I think like having too many itemization changes will be sort of like overwhelming or confusing to just your average player that isn't right. a super vanilla turbo spurg. Like they log in one day and they're like, what the hell happened to my item? And it's like, you know, so I think there has to be like a pretty reasonable balance with a lot of these things. I right. agree. And I like what Nano suggested to, to come in with the 1.5 gear and then change it later on. Um, but honestly, more than like one or two changes, like like you said, stay safe. It's it's going to throw a lot of people off, I think. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do advocate for like the final item stats for the tier gears, but mm. I have issues with the five-man dungeon gear being in their final stats that get updated in 110 so like the Glad gladiator's chest and banthok sash and, and other items that get updated uh, because those become really really good um and would you know that same idea right over um compensate for for raid gear so there's like there's no perfect world here in the progressive itemization uh you kind of have to ad hoc it um mm -hmm. But the good thing is, is that Classic gives them like an opportunity to just create the new normal, um, without changing the heart of the the system that much, right? Yeah. You can mm -hmm. have you, these are your molten core drops from 1.5 until the end of vanilla. These were the molten core drops. These are the molten core drops in Classic, and so that's kind of the idea that behind behind all that, and it allows them to create the drop tables once and not have to edit them again, um, and you know. From a design perspective, that sounds nice. Yeah, I think uh, I think it certainly changes some things. So, like on on Nas specifically, they did what you said, right? With the with the tier two sets, like just using that for example. Well, we uh, actually updated those tier sets like four different times over the course. of Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so I I, I was under the impression because I didn't play Nost, uh I've said that before. Uh, I was under the impression that the Paladin set, whenever it was introduced, was a spell power set in one point six. That's that's why I said that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I had heard that before. So that's my mistake. But um but yeah, no, I, I think that that's something that's probably reasonable. That's something that's probably is gonna happen, is that they won't go through and they won't update every single item, but there's certain things that are just like too powerful early on if they go with the final version. Um right. <clears throat> So this this might be like an oversimplification, but how many how many itemization changes do you think is too many like is is two too many is three too many and if it's like i i sort of think too like if i if i had to pick when they're gonna do like mass itemization changes i would say probably phase three and phase five does that make sense i think two is too many i think, I think having so. having a moment where things get upgraded makes sense like you can sell that to the players you can communicate that to the players like guys tier five or phase five is coming out Here's the, like, coming with phase five is part of also the big blue dungeon upgrade mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. right? Um, but to say, like, phase three, just remember, guys, like, your tier gear gets updated this phase, but not this gear. But that that's hard for, for them to communicate properly for the, the normal average player to not be confused, like, why their previously bad green ring is now really good blue ring that's level 55 or 35 or whatever it is. Like, that's too confusing. So I would advocate for, like, the big dungeon shift to happen in 1.10 or Phase 5 as we have it now. Would you include the PvP gear in that, or would that be kind of a separate thing? I, I would also. Um, but that that's a difficult thing because you don't know the timing of when they're going to do PvP thing. If they did my version of like a uh, month before PWL, um, I I'd, I'd probably do that because you're going to have like five months or six months in between PWL and AQ probably, and mm -hmm. that's enough time for everybody to get rank ten if they want it. So I, I would wait till phase five to upgrade the PvP gear too. Yeah, I think. Um... If, okay, so if you went phase five and you did the PvP gear upgrade, that would make it fall in line with uh, basically to, to where it's on the same level as AQ gear. Because that's essentially what happens. In Retail Vanilla, right. uh, the PvP gear gets updated after the AQ patch to be on par with AQ. But if it comes out, then it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be on par with AQ whenever AQ comes out. So... 
Well, here's the concern with that, right? Let's say let's say people have their gear, right? Let's say people already have their gear, and then AQ comes out, and the day the patch hits, they have gear that's like AQ AQ caliber gear, and they haven't even done AQ yet, right? So we're talking about like the high end. Now, and I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of thinking out loud here. The gear is itemized differently for the PvP sets. Uh, you know, it's got it's very stamina heavy and and whatnot. It's itemized a little bit differently than uh, than the PVE gear is going to be. But I think that would be the one concern is the fact that like if if they do the update and then okay AQ is out, uh, well AQ isn't even out actually the the event has started so right. you might have gear that's on par with AQ gear, right? Um, hmm. So that's that's just something to think about. I think you might be right, but that would be the concern is that you end up having like AQ caliber gear uh, in terms of like itemization points goes. Um, even if it's itemized differently, it's not going to be the best gear for PVE, but it's going to be very, very strong. Yeah, so mm -hmm. like I, I play a Warlock, right? So I'm really familiar with the, the caster gearing process. And so the level 60 blue PVP gear, like you, you want the two piece, you want the head, you want the shoulders. And with the two piece set, you get an extra 23 spell, spell power. And so, but by the time you get to AQ, that set gets replaced by tier 2.5. And so it's not better than the AQ gear that you can get. It just, mm -hmm. it's better than the BWL gear or good enough that you can hold off on caring about the BWL gear until you get to AQ. And so, you know, by allowing it to be accessible early, then you're doing the thing where I mentioned earlier, where you just, uh, you're opening up the doors to anybody can really get to rank 10 if they try. If they're playing enough, you can get to rank 10. So you're just opening the door to everybody's every caster's power level just being able to be that much higher so right yeah it's gonna be very interesting to see i, I think i think you still might be right in, in terms of like uh when they should update the pvp gear because because nax is too late yeah i yeah. Uh, that's what i was gonna say i think that phase yeah. five is the time to do it i mean my concern right now is having updated molten core loot tables at launch like i i would i would update molten core loot tables in phase two or something this is that's why i said like Two, two itemization changes. I don't think having that stuff updated in phase one is the right approach. I think you'd have to update it in phase two, preferably phase two, maybe phase three. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a conversation that's worth having for sure. Yeah, I think a lot of the stuff is just too powerful there at launch. Yeah. It's definitely a can of worms, but I'm guessing we're going to get some updates and some philosophical answers from Blizzard pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, dude, the fact that we've gotten two updates in like two weeks' well, time, within yep. two weeks. Yep. Right. Um, the I previous, think that's a very good sign. The previous shortest period between updates was like 127 days or something. <laughs> yeah. Someone calculated it. Yeah. Right. I'm just yeah. happy that I don't have. I'm not going to have to farm for Spellweaver's turban and Diana's pearl necklace from like the very launch. Of this <laughs> so I'm just really excited that I don't have to do that. Uh, no, I think. Uh, I think I, I like you know kind of touching back on on the thing more broadly. I, I think it's it's a really good sign. I think it's a really good sign. Uh, you know, the fact that we've been pushing for this, uh, a lot of people have been echoing our sentiment and, uh, you know, coming up with this sentiment on their own as well. Uh, and, and Blizzard, Blizzard listening and, and kind of taking the community feedback and saying, you know what, this is actually a good idea. We should do this. Uh, it's, it's a really good sign for, uh, for classic, I think. And, uh, like I said earlier, I, I think Omar and Brian, those guys seem very, very passionate about doing classic the right way, uh, as opposed to like just getting it out there to be like, okay, here we did it, like check the boxes. I think they want to do it the right way, and I think that's really, really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. <clears throat> so kind of. Uh, oh, one thing. I, w w one more thing that I wanted to touch on. Um. Uh, we talked about we talked about how long Phase Five is going to be. Uh, if it's, if it's probably going to last about six months or so, six, seven months, maybe before you get to, uh, before you get to Nax and then Nax phase, that's phase six. It's the scourge invasion, which is really the Nax event. That's like the pre, the pre event, but it's still in the Nax patch. Uh, and then Nax comes out and then that lasted about six months, uh, six, seven months until the 2.0 patch, which happened in December of 2006 and then the 2.0 patch lasted for you know I mean, it didn't last for but it was it was an it was a month between the actual burning crusade patch release and then burning crusade release a little over right if you go and you look at it on that kind of scale there's about a 25 month cycle of vanilla 24 25 month cycle of vanilla and it seems to come up every time but i think this is a good time to actually talk about it uh, a little more <clears throat> 
does the next patch last six, seven months as it did before, before they set a, they put out a new set of fresh servers before they potentially go burning crusade? Uh, or does it last longer than that? Or does it last a little shorter? That's something that I think is really interesting to think about. I think yeah. it really depends on what comes next. Like right. what, what happens after? Are they bringing the server down and offering just, like they're not going to leave that as a stasis server. Like it, it could last forever, right? And it could just be a stasis right. server and people do whatever they want. They hang out. Um, are they going to bring it down and just do complete fresh and you can't play your your classic WoW round one characters anymore? Are they going to transition into Burning Crusade? You know, really, really the transition into Burning Crusade is what dictates how long phase six should last, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, go and, ahead, go ahead. Well, and I'm just saying like the more I think about it, the more difficult it seems like they would just transition to Burning Crusade after six months because just the feasibility study they would have to do to determine whether or not it'd be financially viable to go on to Burning Crusade would probably not be able to be completed until Vanilla's done. Um, that's probably when they would conclude that study at the very minimum because they have to see how it works. I mean, they can't just assume, oh, you know, six months into Classic, yep, this is a big thing, let's do TBC. Well, what if 12 months down the line they just hit a big wall and there's a huge drop off of players? I think, like to, you know, the, to be financially responsible, they have to see the whole thing, the whole thing through. At which point, then they can decide, you know, the specifics of how would we do TBC, and you know, there's the whole patch progression there, and there's the changes there, and the boss nerfs and stuff like that. So we could see three years of vanilla minimum, I think, before TBC even gets announced. But well, yeah, I, I see. I don't think that makes sense from like a like game progression standpoint, right? Because if they if they do it at if they if they don't do it at the end of vanilla, right? At the end of one cycle of vanilla, then they have to do it at the end of two cycles of vanilla. So, yeah. cuz it would kill the server, right? And we've seen this on private servers all the time where one private server goes and they last for about, you know, a, a year or so, maybe less, maybe more. And then another private server comes in and they're like, "Oh, like we want all the players." And then people like they they spur down like, "Oh, I want to go play fresh," right? For, for a number of reasons, right? The fresh experience is fun. Uh they get a chance to like they screwed up last time they they get a chance to go fix their mistakes on a new fresh or whatever right they can go more hardcore if they want to or or whatnot so then people want to go play fresh and then it kills the server beforehand so if you go through and let's say there's like a year before burning crusade actually comes out after the first cycle of vanilla then it could kill it could kill class like it could it, it wouldn't necessarily kill Vanilla Classic, right? There's people who are going to play Vanilla forever. There's people that want to play 1.12 forever. There's people that want to keep re-rolling and playing fresh forever. There's there's certainly a market of people uh, for that, right? There's certainly a market for people like that. If they do this with Burning Crusade, though, is you're going to end up fracturing a lot of guilds because there's going to be people like that who are playing together with people who are not like that and they really want Burning Crusade. Um, I think they, they're going to have to make the decision well in advance of, of one of her... Uh, I mean, they probably would have would have had to make the decision by the time AQ comes out around that time, realistically. Now, I think that the fact that they've gone through and they've pulled everything back from seven three five to one point twelve vanilla is going to I I would I would guess right I would guess I, I'm I'm not one hundred percent sure because I'm I'm not making the game and I'm not super smart programmer man, but I would guess that it's easier to, if you've pulled all this back to progress it forward a little bit, uh, after the fact. And I'm, I'm sure that Blizzard has been working on this with that in mind. I'm sure that they've been thinking like, okay, yeah. there's a potential for us moving forward to burning crusade. Whenever we go through and we, we pull all this stuff back, let's do it the right way so that we can go and push it back forward as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, I agree. Um, I think that's probably something on their mind. I think they're probably, even though not publicly, they're probably internally thinking about what are we going to do after Classic WoW. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think probably rather than a, a three-year Classic server where they decide whether or not they're going to do TBC, it's probably more likely um, if they need extra time just to do two two-year vanilla servers, right? They'll do have the first one, then, a, then another fresh, and then they'll move on to TBC maybe. Um, or, or, you know, like right now, they could already sort of be uh, on the back burner working on Classic TBC, and they could mm -hmm. already be be committed to it. Who knows? I, Who knows? Like I'm, I'm sure that this conversation, like 
what comes after classic was one of the first conversations that they had when they started developing the process yeah. because blizzard regardless of you want to say about bfa i'm not going to make any judgments here but blizzard are the masters of the mmo space right they've owned this mmo space for 14 years uh and they they know that mmos are essentially a, a series of treadmills and carrots on sticks and if you run out of the next thing for you to work towards then your interest goes away right i everyone's seen the guy who's gotten full best in slot gear and then stops logging in like in yeah. well right it's like oh i finally got that drake fang talisman now i can stop playing because dude. my carrot on the stick has gone away and PTSD, so, dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we lost like five of those in my guild <laughs> So, uh, so like you have to have something that comes next for MMOs to be long-term successful. So I'm sure they've had that conversation, but it's not the right time to talk about that yet because there's still so much to get right about the launch of Classic before they start talking about what comes after. So, so I'm sure they've made that this. decision, but they're just gonna, not going to tell us yet. Yeah, let's let's say they've made the decision, and let's say they're they're going all in with Classic DPC. They're already thinking about it. They're serious about it. When do you think we'd hear about it? Phase four, phase five, like at what point is the right time for them to tell us about it? Hey, after Nax, we're, we're going to give you six months of Nax and we're moving on to TBC. I think Tips's point is also right where they need to see the feedback first because they can start mm -hmm. developing, like they're a game development company. They're going to develop things and sometimes it doesn't work and so they have to drop it before they really go all out and, and invest really heavily in it. So yeah. I'm sure like there's probably like two dudes who are like starting the process of like figuring out tbc like what's our reference code like what does it look like how can we do that kind of stuff now already and then once classic is out and they see the response and and you know where it's going from there then they can start investing more heavily in it and at that point then they would feel comfortable saying okay we're definitely doing this and they would announce it when that is, I would I would say that it's going to be after Classic launches somehow, and they can see the response and the ROI and all that kind of stuff. But exactly. I couldn't tell you right. exactly when. And going back to BlizzCon, they, they did kind of give us, I mean, it depends on how much you want to look into this, but they gave us some kind of indication. Um, I can't remember if it was John Hyde or Omar or Brian, but somebody said something along the lines of, when we're in the Classic business, we're in it for good. And right. one of them said... You know, we want to make sure that when we release the, the, the content stages um, that, you know, this is something we can do one year, five year, 10 year, you know, whatever he said, like he, 10, 15 years down the line. They, they said 15 years. Yeah. 15 years. So um, based on that, you know, just deduction, right? I think that their intention as of now is we'll just release fresh servers two, three years down the line, whatever it may be. Um, because when they when we asked them directly during that interview, when we asked them directly, are you thinking about TBC servers? Or somebody asked them, I can't remember who it was. Mm -hmm. um, they said uh, no, or, or they basically said we're not thinking about that right now. Um, I, th well, I think they I think they said their their sole focus is vanilla WoW or classic WoW. I think that's right. yeah, yeah. The focus okay. the focus is basically to get like classic right. This is basically right. the idea. Mm -hmm. They right. want to make sure they get classic right and then go from there. Because I think the the thing that came up was. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, I think the question was Burning Crusade or custom content, right? Not custom content, uh, progressive content after an axe. And like, that's not something that, that we're really like looking on right now. We're just looking at like, let's get, let, let's figure out how to do vanilla right first and then, right. and then go from there. So I think it makes sense. I mean, at the end of the day, they're a business and whatever, whatever they see as like financially viable uh, is what they're going to go with. And I mean, I, I'm a little biased. Uh, but I, <laughs> I think that that going on past vanilla wow, past like classic vanilla is going to be a pretty good idea for them. So absolutely, and like the mm -hmm. only thing that stands in their way, I think, unfortunately, or stands in the community's way, I should say, is unlike vanilla, you don't really have that proof of concept at the same scale <clears throat> that you did with Nostal Race. Like you had Nostal Race, you had millions of accounts or close to a million accounts, hundreds of thousands of players, over fifteen thousand concurrent. You had that major server, the aftermath after it, that sort of catalyzed this whole thing, or at least you would think. With TBC, you don't really have, I don't want to say the demand isn't there. I think the demand is equally there. I think a lot of people want to play TBC again, but you don't have that kind of big catalyst that, that makes Blizzard go back and study it. What are they going to study? How do they study demand for TBC right now? It's, uh, they it's study, a little bit more play TBC. That was... Was Play like TBC, a, noon GMT yeah. plus one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, too uh, soon. Powerful, too powerful soon. servers hosted in Russia. 
Right. <laughs> uh, uh, there you go. Well, yeah, and, and I think that's what a lot of people are, are seeing, right? A lot of people feel like they're, you know, and, and kind of talking back to the private server scene, uh, vanilla is established, right? Like vanilla is something that, and, and really it started with NOS, right? Doing it the right way um, <clears throat> with uh, like progressive content. And okay, we're going to add all the patches, whatever. Uh, that hasn't really been successfully done, I would say, like in, in the private server scene, Burning Crusade, but uh, there's definitely a desire for it because you see hype around it, whatever, and then and then it pretty much falls through every time. Right. Um, and and like I said before, I don't have too much experience with like the Burning Crusade private server scene, but that doesn't mean I don't see it, right? Um, I think I, I think it'll be very interesting to see, but I, I think that Burning Crusade would be a good idea for them to do. And <clears throat> I, okay, I, I want to talk about something that stay safe. Actually, you touched on this like 20 minutes ago, maybe, but I, I think it's a good time to bring it back. Um, you mentioned them possibly saying like, okay, well, like let's like lock this and, and set it aside. Not necessarily like a uh, like what if they do that? Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily just like a stay safe server or whatever. But if they lock it and they do like you know round one, okay, put it aside. I think that the concept of force progression forcing people to go to bc or to like take away people's characters from them uh it's kind of the same in that regard uh and i think it's not a good idea i think i think force progression is not good uh, i think there's people that are going to want to play those characters forever and uh like we've talked about before and, and and you brought this up too with the stasis server like if they go and they move everybody into a stasis server and they want to have everybody okay all the people that want to play 1.12 forever let's keep them here right and then put everybody there. You can you can copy over there. You can transfer over there, whatever. Uh, or you merge sets of servers together as they start to die out. And and I'm kind of you know I'm speaking very broadly here. Uh, I think that you can get really really in depth with it and actually look at like okay like look at the populations here. A horde is higher here. Alliances here. Very similar to how they did like the cross realm uh, battlegrounds in 1.12. They can kind of look at this stuff and package it together and and. Uh, and have it to where the people that want to play 112 forever can do that, and the people that want to go and character copy onto like a Burning Crusade fresh server or something can do that as well. So, yeah. so let me ask you guys this: What do you think is healthier for a Burning Crusade server for transitioning into a Burger, Burning Crusade server? I almost said Burger Crusade. I'm gonna go on one <laughs> well, of those. That sounds this good, evening. dude. Bur Burger Crusade. <laughs> Burning Crusade. I'm hungry. Harold Kumar, Burger Crusade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you think is better for a BC server? Is it? Is it? forcing everyone to and all of their alts and everything and all, all of the materials people have accumulated on their bank alts and everything to transfer over to, to tbc for the server just to go from vanilla to tbc as it did back in the day or for pete or to offer people character transfers because i th i think the first is better actually i think it'd be better for server health i think it'd be better for server economy um otherwise i think you're only going to have like a bunch of like very highly geared level 60 characters transferring to tbc and um i think that that would actually have a lot of negative ramifications on the tbc server Hmm. You said so. You said you you think it should be fresh only. I I, I, don't, I don't misunderstand what you're saying. Um, if they're gonna do TBC, I don't know. I I of of course you. Oh man, people people will be so unhappy with this because I think the best way to do TBC is to have the original classic server become a TBC server as it Oof. did back in vanilla WoW to TBC. I think that's the healthiest way to do it. Th um, that might the, be that's the thing the, like it's... the second best way i think is to have fresh tbc servers and then the third best way where everyone starts at one and plays one to 70 and then the third best way i think um would be to have character transfers yeah i i think i think that you might be right where that's the way that they would want to have to do it and if you want to keep playing vanilla you would character copy over to another server and then you then you can continue to play vanilla on that character um you might be right honestly you might be right i think if you, that if you take vanilla away from people it's gonna be bad dude but you're not you're not taking vanilla well, at away the from same people. time you offer a fresh vanilla server right like, yeah you're not because you. you're not you're not taking vanilla away what you would be doing is like okay if you want to keep playing vanilla then you can copy over here um so the, the what are the concerns with that oh yeah think? okay so i didn't even think about that so you so the character copies would be your deck 60s onto a 60 realm Right. Yeah. Well, onto a new classic realm, but onto, then, onto a one point twelve, onto a one point twelve like stasis server. And then, but that original classic server, everything that's on there that's not transferred or like uh, yeah would go to TBC. Mm -hmm. And you, you, I think you should make it a copy, not a transfer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So, right. so I think having it as a copy, not a transfer, is good because it allows people to play both. Because I know for me, let's say, like, okay, assuming they would do this, right? Assuming they would do this, if they were to, you know, force progression. To burning crusade but allow the option 
of me to, to copy over and play on a vanilla stasis server with my original character uh, versus not do it, I'm much more likely to go keep playing on that 1.12 server uh, if I have my character there because I might not want to re-level another character and go play there. Yeah. You know, uh, I would probably just go play fresh uh, if I really wanted to play vanilla. I, I think the um, downside of a fresh TBC server is that people would feel less inclined at the very end of the classic vanilla servers to, you know, keep playing through Nax and keep, you know what I mean? And keep progressing mm -hmm. their account. Like, I, I think that character attachment is very important and you lose that entire aspect with a fresh TBC server. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, well, something else with fresh TBC to talk about is if you look at every single fresh TBC server, there's always population issues. Always. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, part of it is like, oh, I want to pl go play. A bl Blood Elves are super strong. I mean, they, I, I think Blood Elves are super strong, and I'm particularly biased because I play Paladin, and they're so much better, like so much better as, as Blood Elf as they are than they are like Alliance, uh, Dwarf or Human. Uh, now, Human have their benefits too, or like Alliance has their benefits too, don't get me wrong, but uh, a lot of people really want to go play Blood Elves and Burning Crusade for... Uh, for their racials so you end up having like a massive horde imbalance if it's fresh now if you if you have it to where you can uh like copy or you at least have some form of your original level 60 characters in vanilla then you might be more likely to be like dude i just want to play burning crusade i already have a level 60 gnome mage uh, i'm not gonna go reroll horde i'm just gonna yeah. keep my guy yeah exactly um, I, yeah. I just have a crazy random thought. Like nine months ago in Classic Cast, we were talking about, oh man, I hope they don't add pet battles and I hope they don't have achievements. <laughs> and now we're talking about what's the best way to tr to, to move on to Classic TBC, right? So right. like just, we, we've come a long way <laughs> in the last year. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of logistics issues with a lot of these ideas when it comes to like server populations, tr character transfers, like fresh, whatever. So like if you had... Um, if you didn't transfer everybody, force transfer everybody to TBC, then you have to keep that vanilla server alive. Then you mm -hmm. have to have a second TBC server that's you know available, and then you have to have a new <coughs> fresh, presumably a new fresh classic server. And so now you have, your, and then as the years go by, you're piling up all of this different server stuff um, over and over and over again. Where eventually you just run out of Warcraft names to name all the servers, right? Um, but there's just a lot of logistics issues with running that many different, you know, virtual oh. servers and how they do it these days. So mm -hmm. I don't know what the right answer is. Um, it's probably like, we're not going to solve the issue. Um, they're going to eventually solve it and tell us. Um, I hope that I can always play classic, my classic Claire character forever. I also, if I'm going to play TBC, I'm not really interested in leveling from level one. I want to transfer my classic character to TBC and play TBC as my character from vanilla uh, mm -hmm. because that's how it was. And, uh, and that's, you know, I have investment in that character and I want to keep that investment going. I agree. I agree. So, right. Yeah. I yeah. think, uh, and, and I mean, yeah, we're, we're talking a lot about TBC right now, and, and and that's fine. I mean, we're not we're not here to try and figure out the answer. I think it's something that uh, it's it's a topic that I think is very interesting to touch upon because whenever you go through and you're talking about the entire uh, release schedule of Vanilla WoW, I think it's important to know that you know there there is a final phase in that release schedule, and there's something that happens after that. So we're not here necessarily trying to answer the question, right? But but we are trying to. Um, we are trying to kind of lay out some options. I think this is something that's going to be a big challenge for them to figure out how to do it the right way. And I'm sure it's something that they're probably thinking about. Um, they're probably going to start thinking about it if they haven't started thinking about it already. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so moving on a little bit I, and before we move on, um, Real quick, guys, if you haven't followed, if you haven't followed Nano, uh, stay safe for tips, please go ahead and do and that. S Follow and, and S fan, that, that, that would be nice as well. He's got enough. <laughs> Don't worry about him. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I, their links are in the chat right now. Exclamation point follow. You guys can click on Stay Safe Tips Out Nano. Uh, you know, follow them on Twitch. Follow them on YouTube. Um, all, all that stuff for sure. And Twitter as well. Uh, the, their, uh, their handles are on the screen. So please make sure to do that. And also we're going to do a QA. and a uh, not, not right away, but we're going to do a Q&A here in a little bit. And... Uh, you can you can tweet at us, put hashtag ClassicCast in the tweet because that's what I'll be searching for. Tweet at us, follow us, tweet at us, uh, hashtag ClassicCast in the tweet if you guys want to ask uh, any of us questions. You want to ask Nano any questions while, while we have him here for this episode. Um, please feel free to do that at the end. And then uh, 
let's kind of get to we we talked out about that a lot because it was such big news right the, the new phases but uh the the big reason that we wanted to have nano here today is because of the news that came out prior uh between between the last episode and now we, i guess we had two two updates um <clears throat> was them going through and talking about some of the things that they've seen uh kind of you know Again, they're looking at community feedback, and uh, they've been looking at. Actually, Yithisins mentioned this. Uh, ironically enough, Yithisins mentioned this like right, be- mentioned this right before uh, they put out this update. But he was talking about how there was like that big Reddit post, and um, you know he he was echoing our sentiments about about stuff, and he 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 specifically saw the the big Reddit post about like okay, we saw this different in the demo, we saw this different in the demo, and uh, he took that and he presented that to to the rest of the development team, and. Uh, the what was said in that update really matched up with what Yithisins was saying. It's like, yeah, you know, we've been looking at community feedback and, you know, we've noticed this with like, you know, Warlock summoning. We've noticed this with, uh, you know, the spell crits being double damage uh, and they're not supposed to be right. <clears throat> uh, I think that was really good. And the main thing that we wanted to talk about originally was um, kind of the differences between uh, private server and classic and retail vanilla from a, uh, scripting standpoint, essentially, like how, how things were programmed, how things were coded. So Nano being the QA lead, the, the quality assurance lead, uh, you probably as much as anybody uh, went through and, and were looking at, you know, the the internet time machine, looking at web archives, looking at all this stuff, just trying to find everything on old ThoughtBot articles and stuff, which right. are actually now on Wowhead, which is nice. A lot of the old ThoughtBot stuff is on right. Wowhead. So uh, yeah, your job would have gotten a lot easier now. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you, you're the guy who kind of went through and, and looked at all this stuff, like I said, as much as anybody. So uh, we thought Nano would be a perfect fit for today's show to kind of go through and, and look at a lot of this stuff. It's it's a hot topic right now for sure. Um, do you want to expand on that a little bit, Nano? Like what, what, what were some of the things that uh, – like what were some of like the big decisions that you had to make, I guess, whenever you, you went through and looking at stuff that like, okay, we had this and – well, actually, hold on. Instead of that, let's pull it back a little bit. What percent would you say, I mean, we've talked about this before, how much would you say was stuff that it's like, okay, this is based on research and guesswork and this is like data mined? Uh, that's, that's a great question. So uh, Damon developed a tool to troll uh, Wayback Archives, uh, Wow Alakazam, to get as mm-hmm. many of the, uh, when we were working on the progressive itemization, that was like the biggest challenge that we needed to overcome because we actually had to do that, right? We had to get the data to be able to do that properly. And so he created a bot that trolled all the data off of um, that Wayback Archive for um, so we can access that and they ported that into the database. Um, but there was a ton of errors in that still because if you go to any one item, there's like six different options for how you can get to that item. You can look at it on drop tables. You can look at the item itself. You can look at item sets. You can do all different kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So. Um, that data wasn't perfect. And so it requires a lot of the manual back and forth of like, look, let's look at this, let's look at that. Um, in terms of like what was automated, uh, our core was originally based off of the, the Mangos um, core developed over time on the, the French only realm for install risk where they did a lot of scripting and editing there. Um, mm-hmm. And then eventually built that database for the progressive itemization stuff it, it's hard to say uh, put a percentage on it M- maybe maybe 60 percent automated 40 percent like starting to you know go back and, and find all the different references we could um and like i i'm so jealous of the classic team before um or classic team now because they mm-hmm. have the actual 1.2 reference they can mm-hmm. go back and see exactly how it was and exactly how it is now and see that's and like play the spot the differences game and yeah. and i did like my reference guide my reference code was any random video that i found on wow well, like on youtube or or finding like this random forum post that we're like hoping this dude was actually right when he wrote a detailed <laughs> article yeah. about how things worked uh, like I didn't have a reference guide. I did, I was hodgepodging every, all the info I could find. I would source it. I would collect it. I would make big forum posts about it where we're collecting info for individual bosses or dungeons or you know, classes or all different kinds of things. Um, right. And so it was. There's a lot of like, I was trying to build that reference guide mm-hmm. 
um, with as much information as I could find. Right. Right. And, and I mean, it's obviously like a whole ton of work and, um, it's a, it is very nice that they have that reference card now. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> very good. That's why, very good that's why I, I should say that's why I trust the classic team more than I trust any other person and especially any person's memory because, uh, my memory was wrong on a lot of things like your guys' mm-hmm. memories on how things worked 14 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, are not right like right Um, and that's for everything in life it's not just wow related but like that girl probably wasn't as cute as you like you thought she was 15 (laughs) years ago right or whatever it is um right right yeah or guy or guy or or guy Mm -hmm. or guy Mm -hmm. yeah well i mean Mm -hmm. they they didn't even really start work on classic wow until they you know just sort of accidentally found this old uh 112 client right or this information about 112 prior to that it sounds like they thought it was uh just sort of like just just unfeasible (laughs) Yeah, which, which is which is just, like they would have had to do essentially what you guys did, where it's just go through old videos or forum posts or web archives and just try to pick things out, which is a lot of work. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, it's funny about the memory thing. So, you know, the warlock thing that that Blizzard disproved the summoning of the warlock pets. Um, there are people that still comment on that video that I made like a couple weeks back and they still say, I swear, this is a guy that wrote a comment. Blizzard is lying. I remember. I remember. It would you just ease the bad. Dude. Yeah, yeah. There, there is literally a Drake dog video. Um, I know. I posted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You posted it. Yeah, where he does, and it, it works exactly how Blizzard says it does. Like those guys yeah. are so wrong. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's almost yeah, well, at this point. Dude, I, I don't understand. I very specifically remember Rhett Paladin's doing three thousand DPS at level fifteen. <laughs> so I don't know, like what everybody's talking about. <laughs> That was that was Legion. That was Legion. <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> no, I um, I, I think I think this is very interesting to talk about. We'll we'll talk about some specific examples, right? We'll talk about some specific examples. Um, one of which actually is uh, let's talk about armor and resistances. I know, stay safe. You've brought this up in the past about the resistances. There's been a lot of discussion about armor values, uh, whether in actual vanilla armor values were lower. Uh, or if they were even higher, like nobody really knows, right? There's a number of things that, uh, you know, you made the decision based on like research. You guys made the decisions based on research and you're like, okay, well, we can assume this because of this. Uh, and there's things that you guys made, like even custom changes to, to vanilla. And, and we can talk about that too, right? Things that are different from private server and people just, they get their, their memory gets clouded and they're like, well, I, I mean, it's like this on, it, you know, it was like this on Nost, right? How come it's not like this in vanilla? And it's like, well, it's because they changed it, right? Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about armor and resistances. And just to start with armor, uh, one of the big things that people talk about with armor is somebody went through and they uh, they used kick as a you know as a, as a as a baseline, right? Kick does eighty flat damage, and they looked at somebody's buffs and they they kind of went through and just just you know, meticulously like, okay, they had this, okay, they have dark move fair, whatever, this 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 and this, uh, and it should do. <sighs> I, I think I think in the thumbnail or I think in the in the picture I believe it was like 92 damage. I think I think that I think the two numbers and and I I really should uh I really should have the exact numbers on me. But basically I think they were looking at like 92 damage versus 94 damage, and the idea was is that okay well really on private servers the bosses have too much armor because he should have been doing more damage. Right, you should you should or you should have been, he should have been doing less damage if it's like what it is on private servers. Right. Uh, now there's some assumptions there, right? And and Nano, you uh, you said you've you've seen the same thing, right. uh, where Dark Moon Fair buff, like you see the Dark Moon Fair buff, but you don't know, is it one percent roll? Is it ten percent roll? You don't know that. You don't know anything else really. I mean, there's there's so many other things going on. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So. It, it's very possible, uh, I would say more likely than not, that the post that this person made is good math, doing the right thing, you know, did the best that he could to figure out, and then using the armor you know, formula that we're aware of, you know, figuring out what KT's armor was supposed to be. And it's very possible that KT's armor was supposed to be 3,000 or whatever the result of that post was. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, what that doesn't tell you is it doesn't tell you, well, should every boss now be 3,000 armor? Because mm-hmm. I know that's wrong because I have source on Mixna and a screenshot with, with Beast Lore that's made its way around a little while that Mixna has like 3,735 armor or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but and, and so when you have those differences in armors, like 
when we're developing the the dungeons, we're just making our best guesses. We don't have any references for how much armor Nefarian was supposed to have, and we don't know if Nefarian's armor is supposed to have changed between 1.6 and 1.12, or we don't know if the formula has changed between 1.6 and 1.12. We don't have any of that data. Now we can make our best guesses, which we did, and then we kind of like flatlines. You know, all the bosses are supposed to have this much armor, and we're just going to use that. The last boss, we're going to make a little bit more armor, just because we're going to try to make it harder. Those kind of things. Um, but you know, we we did our best, but we didn't. We don't have the data. Like, I have no idea how much armor patchwork is supposed to have. Like, mm -hmm. KT is supposed to have three thousand. Makes that apparently has three thousand seven hundred. Who knows how much patchwork is supposed to have? Who knows how much Thaddeus is supposed to have? Uh, who knows how much Gluth is supposed to have? There are different types of, you know, you know, characters or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like it's like it's like one's a mage, one's right. a yeah, so one's an A bomb, one's a whatever, and mm -hmm. and that trickles down to everything, every single NPC in the game, not just raid NPCs, but there's turtles out in the world that have like 3,600 armor on uh, the Nos core that uh, people are still using today. Like is at like level 32. Is that right? Should they have 3,600 armor? Should they have 2,600 armor? Like, nobody has any idea. Uh, and so there, there is some, like, dungeon mm -hmm. beast guys that exist for the lower level um, NPCs out in the world. But it, And if you take armor in our unknown and you multiply that to the nth degree, you get to resistances. Mm -hmm. And we have no idea how much resistances, passive resistances, boss are supposed to have. They could have... Mm -hmm. 100 yeah. they could have five they could you know who knows so right. in in the in the wow atlas there are like a handful of bosses maybe like 10 at most and uh each of these bosses that are listed it's just 10 i think kt is actually listed um there are a couple of molten core bosses i don't think there are any from aq i don't think there are any from blackwing layer either um but on the bosses that are listed it, it shows um like two resistances per boss and so, for example, like, I think KT, he has his resistances listed. It's like a frost and a shadow resistance. But we have no idea. So so private service have, have included those because it says those in the atlas. Um, but uh, those are two out of five resistances, right? So it doesn't mention, you know, if, if it mentions, you know, shadow and frost, what's the fire? What's the arcane? What's the whatever? Um, so those are not listed. And also, um, it's it's just a handful of bosses out of, out of several handfuls of bosses, right? So you're right. Most of them... Uh, mm -hmm. It's just complete guesswork. In fact, on, on a lot of private servers, a lot of bosses, their spell resistances are just left at zero. They have they have zero spell resistance. Um, mm -hmm. On top of that, there's supposed to be uh, level-based spell resistance. So if a monster is higher or lower level than you, it gets more or less resistance. Right. And no one knows exactly what that value is either. It, people speculate, but somewhere between five and eight per level. But that's that's not um, sure. That's not known for certain either. So you're absolutely right. Um, the the NOS core, by the way, is eight eight resists per level so eight per level yeah so each boss uh, okay. will have a passive 24 resist to all um if you're a level 60 character yeah okay uh so yeah so people know <laughs> yeah i think uh yeah I, I think it's very interesting uh so and, and then there's like um Kind of speaking of resistances and stuff, I know we talked to we talked to Kevin Jordan, right? The, the Kevin Jordan, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, he's he's failure analysis on Twitch, and he is uh, the original Vanilla WoW class designer. Uh, he, he designed all the classes, main to Ret Paladin, by the way. And uh, he talked about like holy damage and how holy damage. The, the the idea behind holy damage was that there's okay, there's no holy resistance that can't be resisted. And uh, sometimes on private servers, you'll see like partial resist or full resist of holy damage. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, is that is that chalked up to uh, them having a natural resist due to like a level difference? Or is it yeah. like w what's going on there? So nobody really knows. Right. And uh, he has said like the whole point of holy damage was that it can't be resistant. So th there shouldn't be like and there's separate roles. Right. And, and stay safe. I, you can expand on this a lot more. But there's there's separate roles for. Uh, spell resists right there's there's a role for like okay does it hit or not and then once it hits can it get partial right. so uh th that's that's kind of the the yeah uh, and the it, idea it's, it's spell particularly resists. it's particularly confusing for a lot of people because there's yellow resists and there's white resists i think it's uh mm -hmm. i don't, I don't want to get it backwards but one like um so isn't uh, the white resist like if I, it hits I, I think i think white is actually a miss and then a yellow is a is mm -hmm. a is a full resist 
a oh, okay. It's it's like it's like technically it's a one hundred percent partial resist. So it's partially right. resisted one hundred percent. If that oh, I know okay, it's like okay. a weird way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's time, pretty confusing. It works every time. Man. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. True. Uh, True. No, I, yeah, but, I but think both of, them, I, both of them read off as resist, and so a lot of people conflate the two, and it's confusing for a lot of people, uh, mm -hmm. especially when paired with the fact that really no one has any idea like how much resist uh, is on anything. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so so it's it, it is a big thing, uh, and I know like, um, so kind of okay, this is this is something that is. Uh, this is something that like is not really sure, right? People are unsure of this, how how it works, but like the chromatic resistances in BWL, right? Where in you you have the Drakes and you have Chromagus, uh, they go through and they have like a specific weakness, and and Chromagus cycles through his weaknesses. The the big Drakes they they have like a, a preset weakness, like you know you'll find out whenever you start attacking them, uh, to different types of magic, fire, frost, shadow, whatever. Right. The trash, right? Yeah. The yeah, trash, yeah. yeah. Uh, nature, yeah, or nature, or, or whatever, right? Um, <clears throat> but um, the the way that it's scripted on private servers is that they do like I think it's seventy five percent reduced damage if you don't have their weakness, and if you do their weakness, you do way more. Um, and this is to kind of like balance it out, right? Like it's kind of interesting, right? Oh, they're weak to this, so so if you have that kind of spell, use that kind of spell to kill it faster. Um, but the 75% is like a flat 75% magic damage decrease. And if you're using a holy damage, right, where holy damage, there's no resistance. There's no holy resistance in the game. Uh, the only thing close to it, I think, is like a, an absorb, like holy protection potion or something where you can absorb right. holy damage. Um, so there's no holy resistance. So conversely, there's no holy weakness, but it's still reducing that damage on private servers. And I, I haven't, I've tried to go look at old screenshots and stuff. And the only thing that I could find is I, I saw a video of a holy paladin doing Chromagus and he, and he threw a hammer of wrath at Chromagus and it did triple digit damage. So that's why I thought, okay, maybe it's not actually supposed to reduce holy damage, but nobody really knows. And, uh, how it's applied on private. Now this doesn't affect a lot of people, right? This doesn't affect a lot of people. It's like, because you're you're, like six other people. Yeah. It's like, about, it's, it's about seven or eight of us. Yeah. So it's either, it's either smite priests or, or a rep paladin. Um, right. <clears throat> so yeah, it, it doesn't affect a whole lot of people. So that's why like, they obviously wouldn't have a holy resistance or holy weakness because if you have a holy weakness, you very well could have a uh, a raid without any holy damage and it would just be it, it would suck, right? You have forty yeah. people in there and no holy damage would suck. So, does it reduce holy damage at all? Like who who knows? I mean, it I, I think it shouldn't, right? Like just ne like logically how it works, I would I think that it wouldn't reduce it. I would guess that it shouldn't. Um, so let me let me tell you this. I found I'll have to find. I, I lost all my bookmarks when I built my new computer. But I had this old video of a smite priest, um, and it looked like it looked like he had a twenty five percent partial. And the only way that would have happened was if um, obviously there's no holy resistance. But if, if holy was being affected by level based resistance, that's the only way because it's not like his target had had holy resistance. Yeah. Anything. So that would be incredibly like if if it is level based resistance that that's affecting holy damage. The chance of a twenty-five percent partial be incredibly, incredibly small, but yeah. I would, I'll, I'll be so curious um, to see how it plays out in Classic WoW. Yeah, it'll That's be really interesting. interesting. And uh, like, like the big thing, like for me, is like, like that 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 interaction, right? The interaction between the schools and the mobs, and mm -hmm. like also the mobs themselves and the AI that dictates how the mobs operate. And uh, this was actually something that was really interesting that was raised yeah. to me by Valnor. All of the abilities that, or most, the vast majority of the abilities that mobs have in vanilla, especially the world mobs, were backported in manually, um, and the way those abilities are cast is unknown. And one of the most interesting examples he gave me was mobs that have the days ability. You know how like you always get first hit days, like certain yeah. mobs they always mm -hmm. first hit days you. So <laughs> that's actually an ability, and some mobs have it, some mobs don't. And the mobs that have it are programmed on Nostcore to cast it the first spell out of all of their other spells and uh, they mm. use it on cooldown. So that's mm. why, you know, you always get first hit days that, and that's why they cast it. So, you know, repetitively. Yeah. And, yeah. Dude, you, you reminded me of something so cool. Um, I have this old video. I found it a couple months ago. It's, it's of people in 2005 fighting, um, Aminar, the cold bringer, the last boss in uh, Razorfin downs, I think, right. It's the lich at the top of the mound. And, um, the most amazing thing happens, and I've never seen this happen on a private server. Aminar frost novas um, the tank, and then Aminar once the tank is frost novaed, 
Aminar moves away, like five or six yards away from the tank and continues casting Frostbolt. So the tank can't uh, keep auto attacking it. This is a video uh -huh. from 2005. I have never seen that sort of uh, hmm. mob in called ingenuity or, or scripting. Um, I've never seen that on a private server. Mm -hmm. It was it's the craziest thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I'll sh I'll show you guys. It's a video from 2005. Uh, I do believe that that uh, uh, one of the other the I'll just say I don't want to give credit to the other private servers that are active right now, but the competing private server when NOS was released had some interaction like that where things like oh really the Defius Pillagers would run like Frost Nova and run away from you and stuff like that. So hmm. that, that did exist, but that was something that they developed to add to it. It wasn't like built into the AI that existed. Yeah. Uh, mm. Mm. Okay. And so like, let's let's yeah. oh sorry zips go ahead and, and like the big thing that i noticed too is like like i give the example in the video that i talked about this but when you interrupt mobs that that are casting spells mobs that have multiple schools of, of magic damage or magical spells when you interrupt them on nostcore they automatically like instantaneously start casting their next magic school uh, spell that's available to them and if you go like anywhere else, like on retail WoW, if you interrupt a mob that has multiple magic school damage, it will automatically stop just for a second or two. Uh, it'll auto attack you or something like that. And then it'll begin casting the next spell. So you can't just chain interrupt back to back to back to back. You have to wait until the second spell gets cast, basically. Yeah. So like you can experience, like we, we talked about this earlier a little bit and, and thinking about it more. So, um, most casters and healers, you'll have the experience on Chazor, right? Who does the big AOE interrupt. If you get interrupted, it cycles a global cooldown. And then you can start mm -hmm. casting again. So when you get un interrupted, you have the global cooldown that happens before you can start casting again. Most likely what's happening on the NOS core is that uh, the, the AI mobs don't have a global cooldown. So they don't have to wait that 1.5 seconds before they can start casting again. And so uh, most likely that's what's going on there in that in that situation where they're they would they're always going to try to cast the next spell immediately, but then that that GCD process for the mobs isn't being applied properly most likely. Ah, uh, mm. interesting. Yeah, so the AI are cheaters. <laughs> yeah. So with um, yeah, we we touched on intentional changes. I think that's something that we should certainly talk about is some of the intentional changes that you guys made and that private servers make in general um, with Vanilla WoW. Things that were different from retail Vanilla and they did it on purpose because it's like, well, this is better for the health of the game right. if we have blank. Uh, one of those things are the changes to Dire Mall, uh, farming Dire Mall. Do you want to talk about that a little bit to, to explain exactly what it is? Yeah, so uh, there's a number of controversial changes that we made to... Um, try to lower the amount of um, industrial level gold farming uh, <laughs> as as the terms that we used um, uh, more sp like specifically behind the hood there's a lot of exploits that people were using to get to the end point of dire mall tribute that most players weren't aware of that we were working on fixes to get rid of but still existed and so certain types of players were running dire mall tribute for that box over and over and over again and doing it super efficiently to the point where they were farming so much gold that they're then using to sell to other players um and so what's the fastest way for us to keep them from being able to do that is is changing the way that the encounter works so it's not able to be sold that was the fastest way and then we go back and try to fix the exploit more deeply itself um so that's a little bit behind the hood in terms of dire mall tribute which was the most lucrative farm for a long time on on nostalrius um and so a lot of the fight a lot of the stuff that we we're doing is like fighting against industrial level gold farmers because they were using mm -hmm. that gold to then impact the server in other ways and selling it and all the different kinds of things so it's not just like we don't want people to be able to farm bugs in dire mall tribute to, in order to sell the grays um to to vendors because it's lucrative farm like gold it's, it's like mm -hmm. we have to be careful and how we design and manage the server to keep gold's inflation from being to a point where the average player is going to be priced out of being able to you know, participate in the rest of the game 
Right. So that that's something that we had to consider and and take advantage like and and take action against. Mm-hmm. Should Blizzard naturally... do it? Yeah. Should Blizzard do it in classic? Should Blizzard do the same thing? So we don't know exactly if the drop tables that we had were right. I'm I'm mm-hmm. certain that Blizzard has more. Um, uh, so, for instance, like Dire Mall Tribute X, what I'm talking about, where people were able to skip most of it um, and be able to, you know, kill the king and like do a whole run in less mm-hmm. than five minutes, kind of, kind of farming. <laughs> um, like, I'm sure Blizzard's going to be able to handle all that kind of stuff, um, and I doubt that Blizzard goes out of their way to change the way that the fight works, so it's impossible to be soloed. Um, well, is like, is this something that you think people were botting, or was it actually a player that was doing this? Players uh, most likely, most likely botting. Okay. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. but there's just so many players, and there's so small of a staff, and it's instanced botting, right? So it's really difficult for us to police people on their own instances uh, because almost every single bot player that gets reported, they get investigate. Like every single report was investigated for botting but it's hard to report somebody who's running from dire mall west to dire mall north to do that farm right you'd have to like report every single person and that's just like unfeasible with the amount of people there on the server yeah um uh, i i don't know like there's always gonna be more lucrative gold farms than other gold farms like when dire mall east was uh, nerfed on nos core people started farming in uh, brd right the AOE mage farm and BRD and people were using that to sell stuff in order to make gold. So there's always going to be a most lucrative way to make gold. It's just it's it's very dangerous to have the most lucrative way be in an instance because that's completely like outside of the rest of the economy of the mm-hmm. game. It's non-competitive. People can do that on their own time. They're going to do it as much as they want without interruption and that's not like MMOs, so right. we tried to take steps to nerf those, to try to push the most lucrative gold farms out into the world, mm-hmm. where it then becomes competitive. It doesn't impact the economy as much. Mm-hmm. And, and Blizzard themselves did that too, to an extent. With uh, I mean, the fact that you can only do so many resets of a raid uh, in, in an hour. So there, there's some there's some stuff in the game already for that. But uh, at least for well, you guys, you didn't see it as enough. In vanilla WoW, it was five, and I think now in retail, it's uh, it's ten. So if, if they were if they were doing mm-hmm. five minute I'm not familiar with with the exact farm you're talking about but five minute tribute runs they'd still have like over half an hour of downtime I guess they'd be botting multiple accounts so it wouldn't really matter right right, right. I mean yeah. hunters are not very hard to level yeah right you're mm-hmm. them and you have a, a team <laughs> behind it so and you did not have to be very well geared at all you can you know have level sixty starter gear and be able to have soul right. loads so right yeah mm-hmm. so. Something else, um, you know, th- that was just like one intentional change. W- what's another big intentional change? I mean, are, are there any more that come to mind, like things that you guys did or things that maybe have been done on other private servers uh, that you guys thought were, were generally good for the health of the game? So, and not this isn't like nerfing or, or specifically going our way to change things as they used to be, but there are some intentional design decisions that we went through. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of times when it came to to raids right so our vision and how we were going to uh, design raids would try to be looking for the pre-nerf versions of Mm -hmm. different bosses for instance so we wanted to use the pre-nerf version of anixia where the fireball system was different than it was after so 1.3 was the the change between anixia's original form and its later form we believe that the earlier form was more difficult, so we wanted to try mm-hmm. to get that. So the 1.3 form is what's on last core today, which is that firebolt comes with a conflagrate effect where you get disoriented for three seconds and does an AoE disor- disorient around the person that was targeted. The later version just sends three fireballs out to the top three threat targets and does flat damage. We didn't feel like that was very difficult, so we wanted to up the difficulty and we made that intentional design decision. Most mm-hmm. likely, I would imagine that Blizzard's going to use the final 1.12 design for that boss um, because that was in 1.12. So those kind of design decisions, we we you know we intentionally set out to do something different than what was 1.12. There mm-hmm. you go. One one uh-huh. that you already talked about, um, and actually every private server has done this as far as I know, is uh, having the PvP system there originally. That that's a very very big change, and I think right. a lot of people that have been playing on private servers they don't even really. 
um, grasp it at this point because it's been just so common on private servers for so long. Uh, that's going to be a big like uh, splash of cold water going into Classic WoW where they mm -hmm. they won't have the the PVP system there at launch. Right. Guess you just have to PVP for the fun of it. For the fun of it, yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> for it the fun, <laughs> unbelievable, <laughs> dude. Oh, God, I hate fun. Fun's terrible. But yeah, it it is a big change, you know, entering Blackwing Lair with half your raid group, uh, you know, with rank fourteen weapons or, or whatever it is, right? It's it really makes the content easier. Right. Uh, another thing um, that's been talked about uh, in video in other videos, but world buffs is a really big thing that we we uh, I should say that we didn't change to be Blizz like um, even though we knew that it would be Blizz like um, so uh, for those that don't know uh, specifically for the rallying cry of the dragon slayer buff that um, there was a timer that was in between mm -hmm. the amount of time you could drop the head so to speak and receive the rallying cry of the dragon slayer buff Famously, uh, Nihilum, I believe, trolled Death and Taxes before they were trying to kill KT and <laughs> dropped the head early so they would not be able to actually get the Rattling Cry of the Dragon Slayer buff when they were intending to go raid and try to compete for World First at KT. That's a pretty mm -hmm. famous example of that being true. Um, and they did that intentionally. I'm not I think I guess they maybe paid somebody to drop the head <laughs> on the US. Just server. like dirty, dirty yeah. tactics. Um, <laughs> but we didn't we didn't have that cooldown exist um, mm -hmm. on the NOS core. And a couple of reasons why we decided against it, because we did have a conversation of whether we should do it or not, is one, our population was insane. Uh, like if you just yeah. stood in Stormwind or Orgrimmar during you know main raid times, you'd see oh, a head dr buff dropping like every five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, like guilds are there at the same time, and one just happens to drop when your whole guild is waiting for one. You're like, I guess we don't have to drop a head today. Yeah. Right. Just move on. It's like yeah, it was happening so frequently that um, there's just so many people on the server. It, we couldn't decide on what the right cooldown should be. Um, other because everything else was dynamic and then we felt like if we did change it it wasn't worth the PR headache that we'd have to deal with between right. all the people who's now uh, raiding meta relied on them getting raid buffs constantly and so mm -hmm. it wasn't worth the fight for us to, to nerf Rallying Cry the Dragon Slayer uh, or um, the, the War Chief's Blessing buff so yeah I think um I mean, that's something that, you know, just thinking about that, uh, it is pretty brutal to like, let's say you're you're going and you want to raid at a certain time. Now, uh, another thing to add on to that is the fact that NOST was, you know, private servers in general, they're international servers, right? So there's people around the clock. So you might have like two times during the day where all of a sudden just ads are just like popping off like left and right. right. Um, but then you also get it, you know, naturally throughout the course of the day as well. I think if, if they were to keep that cooldown in, I mean, again, a lot of this depends on like server population, right? If they're to keep that cooldown in, then you would almost have to like set up in, in like a, like a, like a cartel, <laughs> like, a, like an Ixia head cartel. And it's well, like, okay, guys, every guild yeah, is going to raid like at this what, time. That's probably what's going to happen. That's uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's such an interesting social dynamic. And um, if you want to break out of the cartel or not be a part of it, I mean, what you would do is, like let's say you're doing two it'd be or three so audio easy to screw week. everybody what you well, what you do is before you want to let's say i want to raid at 6 p.m okay i'm also going to drop an ani buff at 4 p.m so i so i know at 6 p.m i'm able to drop it when i want to go raid so you would you would drop multiple on raid day to ensure that it's up at the time you want it to be up yeah That's what you'd have good. To do. like you That's almost good. have people doing it on cooldown wait, wait, what was the original it wasn't two hours was it i'm it's pretty sure it was six hours that's what I thought too. Yeah. What, yeah. Okay. I I had heard two hours. Whatever it was. So, so the buff lasts for two hours, but I'm pretty sure yeah. the buff mm -hmm. wouldn't drop if the head existed while if it was hanging in the uh, either on the spike in Orgrimmar or in the yeah. gates in Stormwinds, and I'm pretty sure that head lasted for six hours. Yeah. So, and that's the annoying part, right? Is the fact that okay, if you if it lasts for two hours and then the cooldown is six hours, then you basically have four hours where it's just like nobody can get a buff. Um, right. I don't know. That'll be that'll be interesting. I think that'll uh, it's gonna be very interesting. The effect that that's gonna have on rating. Um, I, have I have a lot of opinions about world buffs. Um, 
mostly that I I don't like them because yeah. they're, they're pretty toxic for the raiding meta. And so part of me hopes that they don't even apply in raids at all, even though I don't think that's <laughs> going to happen because uh, that wasn't classic. Like they were available right. on classic and I think they're going to be available on, on classic. But um, yeah, uh, anything that, that lowers the ubiquity of world buffs I'm in favor of. Mm-hmm. Very, yeah, very I mean, interesting. personally, I am not a big fan of world buffs. If they got rid of them, uh, I would not be too upset, but it was vanilla. Uh, it, it is a cool thing because, you know, it, it's it's a new, like, player interaction dynamic. You know, okay, we're going to go get Dire Mode buffs. That's an opportunity for people to snipe you or, or purge your buffs. Or, okay, we're going to okay. go stack up and get Song Flower. That's a world PvP event, potentially. Right. Um, but no, nothing is more frustrating than being in a raid and you're the guy that gets burning adrenaline and you die. <laughs> And uh, yeah. now, now you're not competitive for the next hour and a half. Yeah, that's and, that's always uh, me. Yeah. That's part of the reason why. I hate them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or or just some stupid idiot, you know, does the wrong thing, wipes <laughs> the raid, and um, it's over. Like, or you're, yeah. you're still going to go in and clear it, but your logs are ruined. And it's it's very very frustrating. Dude, one time with burning adrenaline, I uh, <laughs> so what you can do, right? If you get burning adrenaline, you can technically you can hearth out. Okay, you can hearth out and then you can log out wherever you're at. So if you're in an inn, right, you hearth, you're in an inn, you get instant log out. And because how debuffs work, your debuffs tick down while you're offline, but your buffs don't. So what you would do is you would hearth out, log out, and you just you, you would lose your burning adrenaline and then you would log back in and then you get someone back. But that slows down your raid or whatever. It, it's kind of annoying, but at least you're towards the front during during the veil fight. One time, one time, one time I hearthed out and I was like, oh, thank God I did it. And I forgot to log out and I blew up the entire inn in Iron Forge. It was, dude, I was like so frustrated because I was like, oh, I did the thing. And then I, I was going to keep my buffs. And then no, I just, oh man, not good. Yeah, not good. But, uh, but yeah, no, that was like, just like one way to counteract it. And I, uh, and I blew it. So funny story. Yeah. You literally blew mm -hmm. it. I literally blew it. Yeah, literally blew it. Couldn't hold it. No, it was not good. It was not good. So, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, I, I think that it's really interesting to talk about all this stuff and and to look at you know things that you guys intentionally did, uh, things that you weren't so sure about, right? Whether it's with the um, whether it's with different things with armor or resistances. Um, there's also some other things with uh, well, actually, one more thing, right? And and this is related to what we were just talking about with the world buffs. Uh, and how they might want to approach it. How did you guys come up with population cap decision? Like, how how did you guys approach the uh, that question? And right. um, like with dynamic respawn, you guys decided to go with okay, let's go with a really big cap dynamic respawns. How did you guys kind of come up with that decision? Yeah. Uh, well, we didn't really have that many options because we couldn't afford to open a second realm, um, and mm -hmm. then the logistics of having a second realm you know getting enough population there and balancing like the accessibilities like that just wasn't possible for us to handle so the only option available for us was to have a massive pvp realm with a bunch of people on it and then that creates a ton of new issues that you have to solve and so the way that we solved it was the dynamic respawn system where you know objects in the world um, you know node like mining nodes herbalism nodes quest items those kind of things we all added to a dynamic response system uh there's actually we developed two dynamic response systems the the first dynamic response system was just a flat one based on total world population that mm -hmm. would decrease by percentages based on certain like bench point or benchmark numbers um so like at 3000 population it would be this much less at 6000 population would be this much less and so on and so forth uh and there was also a proximity um, dynamic one for mobs in the world so the more players around a certain mob when it dies would lower its respawn timer kind of thing so those things most likely won't exist classic because they're not going to have the same population issue that we had where they're going to be i doubt that the population will be thirteen thousand people concurrently on a, any given classic server um i don't know what that population in, is going to end up being but most likely your spawn timers for herbs are going to be as they were in 1.12 which would mean an hour for black lotus 45 minutes for 
you know, Dream Foil, like 45 minutes for Plague Bloom and mm. you know, around those times. Um, but the other difference there is that, you know, your spawn points themselves are going to be different than they are in a NOS core. Like the spawning system itself is probably going to be different than how we developed it because we we're right. just going on our best guesses on how that system worked and then where the nodes should be and all the different kinds of stuff. So there's there's a lot to that. But population created a whole set of new issues that were unique to what we we're doing um, and or at least unique to the private server world with super high population servers mm -hmm. that we had to solve. Um, and so w with that and then the way that the population itself is just completely different than it was back in classic, like so many more, like such a higher percentage of the population is raiding on private servers today than they did back in vanilla originally. And so a one hour cooldown timer for Black Lotus back in 2005, that was cool because not that many people were getting Black Lotus. But today, casters are using flasks of supreme power in almost every single raid multiple mm -hmm. times a week and that requires black lotus and so in order to not have that price be so enormously high you have to adjust it somehow and so the service decided to instead of letting the price get super high because of demand to increase the supply to keep the cost low it's funny because that sort mm -hmm. of, um, in an indirect way, made the content easier, you know, because more exactly. Black Lotus, you know, if more bit. right. Yeah, so if, if they keep the spawns um, much longer, as they were in vanilla, that in a roundabout way makes the content a little bit more difficult. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it, it sort of changes the rating meta where only, like, your extreme, like, turbo nerds are going to be flasking, right? And then your, your average player, is, you're probably never flask ever. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it would cost 300 <laughs> gold per Black Lotus, you're not going to see that many flasks around because right. we're not yeah. going to be able to afford that every single raid, every single week. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 300 well, gold uh, for two hours of a flask is a bad <laughs> ROI. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would be, that would not be good. Um, well, also on top of that too, it's like uh, with respect costs and, and this isn't something that you guys did, I believe, but um, this is something that like, uh, you know, that they did on like, uh, on Light's Hope, right? Whenever we, uh, whenever they went from 20 or 50 gold respect cap to 25 gold respect cap uh that they did that in order to increase pvp participation because a lot of people want to respect for pvp and uh respect for pve right and for someone like myself who i would respect for every raid you not everybody does this a lot of times people just play one spec and they just kind of do their thing uh they might only they might focus on pve and they might just only stay spec for pve or pvp or whatever but i would respect every raid so going from my like weekly taxes being 50 gold instead of 100 gold is very very i mean that, that, that was like a good thing for me personally right so if you couple that let's say you're going from 25 gold to 50 gold, so now 100 gold a week, plus the cost of consumables being higher, it's pretty expensive to raid, like at the highest level. And oh, yeah. then you're gonna have to farm like a lot harder. I mean, right, people, will most likely, people will most likely use their, you know, not completely 100% optimum specs and won't use as many consumables, making the bosses harder, not as many world buffs on top of that. So yeah, it definitely well, I, uh, makes, yeah. I think people would still do it. They would still find a way to make it work. It would just be like brutal. Well, the <laughs> top there's, end, there's, man. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah, there, yeah. There's yeah. people out there to do it. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you. One week I was raiding. Uh, so we were we were doing an, an Anixia split run, and I was like, "Ah, yeah, whatever, dude. I'm not going to respec. I was ranking, and I uh -huh. did Anixia as SL uh, Nightfall, which is like the worst Warlock PVE spec ever. Mm -hmm. I did less damage than the tank. Seriously. Last right. image of the tank, and everyone always linked that log every time. Like, oh man, it was terrible. I will never not respec ever again. No. I'm always respecting to raid spec. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a little bit of lag here. I don't know if we want to let it level out or something. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it's, uh... it's getting choppy. I don't know what the deal is. <clears throat> I don't know. It's just video lag. I mean, we can keep going. It's fine. It's just video. Um, but yeah. Um, no, I, I think uh, I think it's very interesting to actually think about all this stuff because a lot of times we look at big picture stuff and uh, a lot of the, the little details end up getting lost. I, I think everybody does this, right? I think a lot of times you look at like big picture stuff and then the little details like under under all the, the crap. It's like, oh, wait, like, OK, there's this. Like, how is this going to actually be treated? So I think yeah. it's, I think it's I mean really interesting to get to talk about some of this stuff, too. With stuff like this, with respects and being optimal raid spec, literally every ra every raid and uh, you know flasking every raid, it comes down to like, um, 
is is there a problem with the game rewarding being extreme no life to that extent and mm -hmm. i i don't really think there is that issue like if, if you want to perform at the highest possible capacity every raid and have a flask and be proper spec every raid um you're gonna have to invest a lot of time you can still clear the content if you're not proper spec and not flast but do you want to like be a top parser on logs you're gonna have to be a no life is that a problem i personally don't think so I mean, we know like from BFA that there's just a different caliber of player that's willing to do far yeah. more than your average player is to, you know, be first. And mm -hmm. so, yep. And like the average player is not going to get into a 100 million gold debt in order to, you know, <laughs> be 20 DPS better on their parse for Nefarian or whatever it is. But right. there's, some, there's some players, there's like a small subset of players that are willing to do that, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, let's talk about some things that are different. Uh, oh, oh, actually, this is one thing that's interesting that I want to talk about. It's Paladin specific. Um, <laughs> yeah, Paladin. Surprise! Okay. Yeah, oh, here it is. Here we big go, surprise. Here we go. Well, oh, so so I know like with Paladins, like on private servers, you guys probably went with that class more than any other class. Uh, just kind of like okay, well, like we got to like hack this together. Like we got to make right. this work this way. And uh, it's also the class that probably had the biggest unknowns. Right, because it's it's not well documented that a lot of people were playing a ret paladin back in vanilla and raiding and whatnot. Right. Um, one of the reasons for that is because paladins didn't get their rework until one point nine, and by that point, like a, a major part of the content had already been uh, had already been like passed through. Right, they added the ret set in AQ forty. Right, so they they did the rework. They gave ret a set, and they're like, okay, here you go, go have fun. Um, but by that point, it was like too late for a lot of people because they hadn't gotten all the other items that they need to to be able to raid as ret until they, you know, over the course of the next six months, happen to get a full ret set, and then maybe their guild in their guild they'd be lucky enough to go raid in Nax. Um, so one of the things that are different, like I, I know for ret paladin specifically, like you guys made it to where uh, Seal Command. Leaving because you're talking about ret. Yeah, it's okay. They, yeah, they can deal with it. <laughs> so a lot of people are gonna be talking about Rhett on this uh, on this stream here. So no, but we um, I I remember one thing that uh that you guys did was I believe you put a half a second delay on Seal of Command, uh, in order to make it actually apply like all the bonuses like Vengeance and Sanctity or like all, all the other bonuses that occur like whenever you're right. doing on hit stuff. Yeah. And um, what ends up happening, and this is something that makes Seal of Command like a little bit worse on like in private servers. Is that if somebody's stunned or you know there's some some form of CC and then you hit them, uh, you can actually end up having a half the half a second delay causes you to possibly get a miss or dodge it. It's avoided somehow because the stun might end, the CC might end, uh, and it, it ends up not applying. Or like let's say they die and you're in, you're in PVE, you hit somebody else kills it and then you die and then it's absorbed. And essentially what happens there is you waste the damage from the proc because it's seven ppm. Whereas, like, if the damage were to have applied right away, you would have hit, and then that DPS is, like, added to your, like, total number or whatever. Now, that's, like, being silly, like, how effective is the damage at that point, whatever, but it's, like, whenever you're looking at, like, the little numbers and parses and whatnot, right. um, how, how it affects it, like, positively. Also in PvP, too. Same thing in PvP, like, with getting the kill or, like, you hit them, you hit them, oh, this is the worst. <laughs> if you hit them in PvP and then you cast a Repentance right after, and then it breaks your Repentance... Because of the Sela command proc is is like brutal, but it's just like little stuff like that, um, little stuff like that. It's it's really interesting to see. Like, okay, we don't really know like how this class played out. So, there's did you things uh, that... did you talk about uh, judgment of crusader stacking yet? No, and, and that's something else. <laughs> okay, that, yeah. well, well, dude, I was telling you, I found a video. Uh, it was actually from the TBC pre patch. It was 2.0, and there was a 40 man paladin raid that went in and tried to kill Nixia. It was this old video someone linked to me. It had like 400 views on YouTube. And uh, there were multiple Judgment of Crusader stacks on uh, on the trash and, and, and mm. on Nixia. I don't know if it was uh, a visual bug or if it was actually applying uh, right. bonus holy damage or what, but um, there were definitely multiple stacks on the mobs. Right. So to to that point, like I I know like we and this is exactly what we talked about early on. I specifically remember like that being a thing. I remember physically seeing multiple stacks of like Judgment of the Crusader on a target, but people don't know is that something that was changed was that something that was just a visual bug that was fixed but then like you said stay safe you 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 you'd brought up the the video it was actually a burning crusade video that you saw it in where it was being stacked so it's like did they get changed and then get changed back like people it, it's something that's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out um 
Because I know that's that's like a topic of controversy in oh, like man. the paladin community. You're gonna think this is really funny. I have a, I have yeah. a video. Um, there's four paladins and a warlock. It's like December 2005. They're doing old man. They're all like in their 40s. And uh, I'm like, okay, for sure, one of like there's gonna be multiple crusaders on this. Not a single one of them judge crusader. <laughs> <laughs> December 2005, red paladins. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hey, that's how it goes, dude. That's how it was. My, the there was a, a couple rep paladins that are very active in the private server scene, or at least were when I was um, helping with the QA team with Nost, and they spent so much time and effort trying to make the the class as good as possible, um, and using the like most beneficial videos that ever existed um, in order to make themselves you know, prove that they were as good as they said that they were. And oftentimes they're like cherry picking something from 2000, you know, like four and like patch 1.4 before they got changed to 1.9 and how it works. And, or like linking things from TBC and saying, prove me that was never supposed to have changed. And those kind of things. Like, uh, when, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to rep paladins, it's really hard because the, it's really hard to say, like the this, <laughs> this the the period of time where you could say that this is how rep paladins are supposed to work during vanilla was very small and the amount of people who are playing rep paladins was also very small and the amount of people who are willing to record themselves playing rep paladins <laughs> <laughs> was even smaller like youtube than didn't that. even exist at the beginning right. of vanilla technically right so. so so being able to find proofs of how everything was actually supposed to work is nearly impossible so yeah. like Trying, I think, yeah. Trying to say how it was supposed to work is very difficult. We did our best and kind of hot podge and ad hoc things together and then make mm -hmm. them work based on how we had the, like, the 1.5 seconds. Obviously, that wasn't right, but we had to do it in a way in order to make the rest of it work. And that was mm -hmm. the best we came up with and all the different kinds of stuff. Like, yeah. We, we do our best. We try not to change things unless we have solid, complete evidence that it was supposed to be that way. And if you can't mm -hmm. prove it uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, then we're not going to we wouldn't have right. changed it we yeah. are we are going to learn a lot come classic wow and i promise mm -hmm. like if there are discrepancies between private servers and classic wow there will be private server people saying no no we had it right on the private server and you guys <laughs> blizzard you have it wrong and like i guarantee right. that's going to come up yes well it already has right it already has yeah yeah, yeah. Shout, i think uh, shout out to killer dookie and uh theo oh, okay <laughs> yeah uh no i i think i i think like you said i think it's just hard to say right i i think it's hard to say because sometimes you see something like, i know i know I, I i've done it too where like i i would see like one thing that i'm not so sure about is like the like berserking buff and divine shield like i remember it not canceling but like is my memory getting clouded from like playing burning crusade right that's whenever i peaked and i've said it before sometimes whenever i get something wrong like i'm like thinking about it incorrectly uh, I'm thinking about Burning Crusade instead of thinking about Vanilla. Like a lot of times, I get I get the the two mixed up, just like recalling on my. Um, so I, yeah, I think I think it's a natural thing. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I guess uh, tips is tips is in a different shard uh, right now, unfortunately. So hopefully, <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe he'll he'll <laughs> he'll run out and run back in here. Uh, but uh, just a reminder, guys, uh, if you haven't yet, give Stacey a follow, give Nano a follow, give Tips a follow. Uh, also subbing on YouTube. Uh, it would be would be a, a great idea for sure. And then uh, we're gonna start a Q and A soon. We'll do Q and A if you guys have any questions for Nano. If you if you guys have any questions for for us, uh, we'll uh, we'll do that on Twitter. And then we'll take some questions from chat as well. But if you guys want to tweet some questions at us, I'm I'm actually gonna go get my phone uh, right now. I, I had it in the charge because it was running out of battery. Yeah, um, sure, yeah. But yeah this, uh, this Red Paladin segment is sponsored by Method. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah, Tips is stuck in another shard. That means that there are too many people watching. We need everyone to leave so we can get Tips back. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. S speaking of Red Paladin stuff, I'm just going to go off on Red Paladin so last one is gone. There was a video. Yes. I, I, I downloaded all these old videos from this like ancient uh, Vanilla WoW like, media sharing site. And uh, one of the videos, it's a level 60 Paladin. He's in full Lawbringer and he has Obsidian Edge Blade. And uh, the video is called like Ret Pal like Sick Ret DPS dot Avi or something, right? Uh, <laughs> Tips is back. Nice. A couple people left. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I think yeah. I think I think whenever we'll I left, it like reset the shard, and then yeah, somebody right. else got sharded. So we're all good. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, like, 
this guy is running around uh, the ghouls just east of Jowen Camp and uh, like attacking them. At, like they're level 51 as if it's like a good job. And he's doing like 150 DPS, by the way. It was like, oh, oh man. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> like one shadow bolt. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, do you guys like my new phone, by the way? This is a, uh, this is a Nokia, actually. Uh, you can see how thick that is. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, dude. What kind of iPhone <laughs> no, is that? No, no, I, I got a, I got a charging case, and uh, oh. yeah, for for the IRL streams. But dude, it's like, it's like five pounds. It's it's pretty heavy. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I like I like chat Nokia the, the Nokia thick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Nokia thick. Of course, <laughs> of course. Uh, okay, so um, let's go ahead and. Uh, Oh, this is a good one. Oh, wait, no, that's something else. Okay. Um, Josh Phillips asks, Class casts, when the PvP ranking was first put in vanilla, it required you to no-life the game for 14 hours a day to get rank 14. It was unchanged patch 1.8 to slightly relax those requirements. Do you think it should be in the same in Classic or start with the latest patch? Uh, so I think the as a general... The brackets got a little bit wider. They got a tiny bit wider, yeah. I, I think as a general rule for the game, I think they're going to go with like with stuff like that. I would I would assume that they're going to go with the 1.12 version, the the latest version of the game. What do you guys think? Absolutely. I think uh, in general, when when you have questions like this, I think they explicitly said at BlizzCon they only were able to recover the data from like 1.8 and beyond, and they decided to commit based on the first water cooler update to commit to the 112 code. So, right. I think if you were just to take a guess. The general approach is 112 unless, and there's some exceptions like the itemization stuff we talked about earlier and some other yeah. things. But I think typically, like default to 112, uh, unless stated otherwise. Yeah. The other thing is like this is gonna be different than from private servers onto classic is that the populations then increase the amount the like honor pools, and which then increase the brackets of the amount of people who can be in bracket one so to speak, and get that standing one level of RP uh, or rank points in order to increase their their rank levels. So, like that's going to be very different so you're not going to have as many people being able to hit rank 14 as quickly just because the populations are lower and the amount of on people in the honor pools are going to be significantly lower so that's one thing to consider as well it's like it'll be like that level of 1.8 most likely um it's not going to be like i'll be shocked if it's the pre 1.8 version of difficulty to get rank 14 but it's also not going to be quite as um simple as it is on on private service now when when it comes to like the brackets and getting your r pupils mm -hmm. yeah i think uh, so on private service we've seen that brackets are very 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 well coordinated because uh there's just a lot of like you said there's just a lot of like there's a very active ranking community on private servers because all all these like super turbo nerds are condensed onto one server right mm -hmm. um i think on a lot of classical servers ranking will be a lot more uh hectic and less coordinated there'll be a lot less bracket stacking right um It'll be sort of like uh, anyone's game every week is is sort of what I expect, right? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, I, I think with because uh, because we're we're planning on all playing on the same server uh, on a PvP server, and uh, the brackets for Alliance and Horde are different. So, which is kind of interesting, right? And with how with how the uh, with how the honor system works, like you're you're really competing against your teammates as opposed to competing against the opposing faction, right? But um, I, mean, I, I guess that's just how it is, right? Um, I think that we would like to have the brackets organized. I mean, Stay Safe and I are going to play Alliance. Tips is going to play Horde, but at least on the Alliance side, we would like to try a more like organized approach with the brackets. But who knows how that's actually going to play out? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, everyone is hoping for minimal honor wars. When let's say let's say you have brackets established, and you know who's going to get you know how many bracket one spots, who's getting the bracket two spots. Anytime someone like an like another pre-made on your own faction steps up and says, actually, uh, we want the bracket one spots for our pre-made, that's a problem for everyone because the bracket system is is based on a, a, a percentile scale, right? Um, and it's like a pyramid that expands the further you go down the brackets. And um, if there's an honor war, the bracket one spots are more competitive, more honor required, and that trickles down on everyone else. And so mm -hmm. that uh, should be minimized. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty brutal. I disagree. Go go all out. Be competitive. <laughs> Kill each other. 
sixteen hours a day in order to get rank fourteen. Uh, yeah. I, I, can, I can't speak on behalf of everyone on the Horde side of the server, but I can say it's going to be fun watching Stay Safe and S Fan uh, fight over the honor stuff. I think it's going to be really funny. It's well, gonna be crazy. Yeah. The bracket sixteen is going to tough competition. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think. Um... And we we've talked about how, like how we want to approach it off stream a couple of times. We're still not sure yet, but I think it'll I think it'll be fun because it, a lot of it depends on when they want to put the PvP system in too, right? Like I, I know for me, I've only ranked a ten in the past because I, I hit a point where I was like, wait, I don't need to do this because I'm I'm like getting rating gear and stuff. So it'll yeah. it'll be really interesting to see how uh, when when the gear is put in, when um. Uh, when the rewards are put in, what rewards are put in at, at what point, if the battlegrounds are all put in at once or if they stagger the battleground release somehow. Um, One thing... Oh, sorry, I cut you off there. Well, no, no, I mean, you can go ahead. I was... Digressing. I was gonna say one thing. I'm, I'm not like this is a personal issue, and it shouldn't influence gameplay or like game design really. But if if they if they add the honor system in phase two, um, that would like let's say I'm ranking for three or three and a half months to get 14, that would spill over very likely in a BWL launch. And so imagine mm -hmm. it's like week 10 of my 12 week process and BWL comes out and that, that would really be a wrench in the, in the grind. Right. All right. You're yeah, I think, to uh... excuse you from BWL. So you can... <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a good question. Kind of, uh, you know, talking about PVP and, and the ranking system and whatnot. This is from Chris Hansen. Uh, I gotta leave. <laughs> no, the guy's yeah. name is Chris Hansen. <laughs> not <laughs> good, dude. Okay, not good. Okay. Take a seat. Uh, would, it, <laughs> would, would it be possible to have PvP and the ranking system in phase one, uh, but temporarily gate the rep rewards and PvP rewards to answer the gear to patch and balance? So uh, he's, he's talking about basically, you know, you put in the PvP system early and then put in the gear later. Uh, the thing that I don't like about this is the fact that it, it doesn't really, like, you end up not having the gear earlier like if you attain the ranks but if you have the rank then you can just go buy the gear as soon as the gear is put in the game so uh yeah you can basically yeah uh, you're basically getting like a jump start and like early farming it and and here's here's the issue here's how the current ranking system works or here's how it worked in vanilla WoW, right you get the rank you buy the gear after you derank you rank back down you don't retain the title and you don't retain the ability to purchase the gear so you let's say you get rank 14 you can only buy the weapons the week you're 14 you don't retain it um, so once you D rank and you will D rank, no one retains 14. <laughs> um, I, I, wa I wonder actually how long someone has retained 14, if anyone has like been that yeah. much of a super nerd. But anyway, um, they would have to change some things where it's like, okay, that you can current, you can always buy the gear at the highest rank you attained. That would change things a little bit. Um, I, I would just leave it as is. And, yeah. And, and, I, and be, be smart about when they, they launch. When they put it in. Yeah. Right. It I don't know if there's any any MMO system that's ever been successful that hasn't been tied to a reward system. So if you right. didn't have, like, if you had the ranking system in, but you didn't have the rewards yet, people would play as if the rewards are coming, and mm -hmm. they don't know exact. If they don't know exactly when they're coming, then they're not going to bother. I mean, I love the idea of having BGs in with no honor system because I think it's just fun. But I think I would be sitting in queue forever because nobody else would be wanting to BG because there's no point Probably. to it other, mm -hmm. other than fun. If I, You can just go out and do world PvP. So there, there always has to be a reward system tied to any other game system in MMOs. Otherwise, people just don't do it. Like, how many people play Mr. Pandaria and just never did scenarios because it, there was never any rewards attached to it? Like other than eventually they added the challenge modes and that kind of stuff, but you just didn't do it because there was no rewards. So you are definitely right. right. Players, players respond to incentives. The incentives have to be there. Right. Yeah. I'm not That's sure actually, if. Uh, sorry, go ahead. I'm not sure if this was covered in the question, but did we talk about cross round BGs? Uh, no. Uh, that's something we've talked about before, but uh, okay. I think it's a good thing to address for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, people. We. Uh, I know, I know. For me, I, I've said before that I don't like I don't like cross realm. I just I don't like cross realm battlegrounds. I I feel like cross realm battlegrounds were put in in preparation for the. I mean, there they, they were a necessity for Burning Crusade, right? With how the arena system works and whatnot. Because if you didn't have it like that, then you would have one team sitting at the top waiting like two hours to queue, right? You you, you would have had to have it like that. Um, it also was a necessity for servers that had big population imbalance. And what they did was they would match up servers with 
like, oh, this ho- the server is horde heavy, the server is alliance heavy. Let's put them together. So now you have basically like you know a roughly like fifty fifty split, and uh, you do these cross room battlegrounds, and uh, you'd, you'd package them all together. And we talked about this a little bit on the last one. Then you had like the like the nightfall battle group BG nine. Uh, you, you had all these different battle groups, and um, what would happen? was or the the purpose of this was basically so people could queue for battlegrounds faster and uh for people to to be able to actually like play all the content in the game as opposed to sitting in like hour long queues on some servers trying to wait for 10 alliance to queue for a war song so <clears throat> uh i think that while i don't like them stay safe as in the past brought up the point that like they might end up being a necessary evil uh, they might end up being a necessary evil that like okay like this is just like some servers are like literally dying off because they can't pe- they can't do battlegrounds, um, and they end up might having to do that they might might have to do that so, um, what do you guys think? I uh, I heard a recommendation from Tribe the other day and I really liked uh, yeah. his idea. Um, essentially, start off without them, and over time as you start to see you know which servers are are tilted into which factions direction. Mm -hmm. slowly form battle groups but when it comes to the actual queuing algorithm make it so let's say you queue you queue up for bg um for the first like five minutes or whatever predetermined number of the queue it would only try to pull you from people from your server and then uh let's say you don't find anybody from your server then it queues you up with another server cluster of like two or three more servers for the next five minutes and then if that doesn't pair you up with anybody, then it expands to the full battle group or something like that. And you yeah. can have different thresholds the- within within that queue time. So ultimately, the, the final number would be, you know, 15 realm battle groups like we had back in vanilla. But there would be kind of intermittent pairing on the way to, to try to keep you with like a more uh, community-based group. The problem I, I, with that... Okay, I'll, Sorry, I'll you go ahead first. Okay. I was going to say the problem with that is... If you have a situation where they have like a heavily populated server put into the battle group in order to help balance out the rest of the the rest of the servers, it ends up basically okay that that server has priority for its own server, and then if people are actually active in queuing on that server anyway, then they end up not providing benefit to any of the other servers. Whereas they, I mean, it doesn't change at all for them, but all the other servers don't get the benefit of being in the same cluster as them. Mm-hmm. So I, that's that's what I would be worried about because if it's like you might have like five minute queues on both sides anyway on one server and then it never bleeds over, then maybe take away that first step and immediately start queuing from a smaller cluster like three servers and then expand to the fifteen battle right. groups well, or so. Right. Well, I mean, and that's the thing, right? Like, and that's kind of like what Stacey had brought up in the past too. Is like if if it's something they have to implement later on, yeah. um, and I'm sure yeah. it wouldn't be big clusters. Like, I don't know. If, if, if there needs to be cross realm battle groups, you know, there probably will be at some point. Probably not the start, but there probably will be down the road. I mean, if the option is no queue, let's say there's like six like six or seven people per side sitting in the queue and you need 10 to, to, for it to pop. Um, you know, having like six or seven people from your server and then three three fillers from another from another server, I mean, that's 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 better than no queue, right? Um, mm-hmm. yeah, so, you know, most of most of the time, um, so you can either you can either pull people from your own server and you can be on like the the... the like the, the majority server, or you would occasionally get pulled from another server into another person's like majority game, if that makes sense. And so, you know, most of the time it'd be filled with people from your people from your server or entirely people from your server, but like maybe 10% of the time you'd be used as a filler person. I don't really think that's like the end of the world. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I have distinct memories of playing like when AB came out and my, my PVP pre-made would queue up in Arathi in the actual portal, go play a game, come out, queue back up again, estimated wait time 47 minutes. It's like, okay, now what do we do for 47 minutes? And like, okay, I guess we'll just go hammer, like, we'll go to Hammer Mill and we'll just kill everybody that comes out of their battleground portal or like, we'll go do something else. And like, that was cool at the time because that was the only option available to us, Mm -hmm. but we would have preferred to play, um, like more frequently than that, um, and that's eventually why they added the cross realms. And and I think yeah, Estefan's right. Like the arena system, you need a, just a larger pool of people. And so when they were prepping for you know TBC, and they knew they had the arena system coming, they set it up for the 1.12 to do the cross realm battlegrounds. And 
if I had a guess that we're, we're going to have cross-run battlegrounds, we don't know exactly how the servers are going to look or how they're going to be built or anything like that yet. But if they're anything like they were back in Classic, I would bet they're going to add the cross-run battlegrounds, which I think is a loss in, in obviously some ways because I liked playing against the same people over and over and over again and knowing their names and knowing their tendencies as players and like how that one druid likes to sneak up against the, the pole <laughs> on the flag. And like yeah. you, always, you always know to watch out for that one druid because he was always really sneaky like that kind of stuff is really cool and really valuable to classic and i hope that we have that but if i had to guess from a design perspective they're going to be doing cross realms absolutely mm -hmm. and i saw a lot of people when we, when we even mentioned cross realms a lot of people were like no you know horrible blah 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 and and i definitely agree i definitely prefer that it is you know restricted to your own server but the reality is it is so destructive not just for queue times on servers it's so destructive to have imbalanced servers when it comes to bgs because if the dominant faction is not able to queue up for a bg what you'll see is the dominant faction will just go out into the world to collect honor and you're gonna have a situation Snowballs. yeah you're gonna have a situation where they've got 40 minute queues so they're an epl slaughtering everybody level 48 and above or a wpl or or freaking searing gorge bring steps anywhere just slaughtering everybody on the uh, on the less dominant faction mm -hmm. and uh, you're going to be in a situation where that causes more people from the less populated faction to leave change servers stop playing which in turn increases queue times which means more people are going to be shredding people in the lower zones and it literally destroys the server and we're well, seeing this on northdale yeah. right now it, it is literally happening right now on nd you only now, die if you're bad, okay? So just yeah. don't be bad, and then you just win. <laughs> and the, the, the result, the, the end result is around like 20 to 25 dominant alliance guilds and like three uh, good horde guilds, and it's it's just not uh, fun. Nobody's having a good time, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's just kind of like the nature of how the the private servers will, will go as well, generally. Uh, you know what's okay? So what's funny is like there's people who say it's like it's like like stop being care bears, no changes. Well, hey, newsflash, buddy. No changes is cross realm that was put in the 1.12 patch. So that's that's been a little while. Uh, that's a change that I mean it's not it's not even a change. It's just something that wasn't a thing on private servers, right? So people just like don't know that. Um, yeah, I don't know. So like a lot of times, like people like I don't know. It, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, speaking speaking to the faction imbalancing, like Tips is absolutely right. By the way, Tips is right. I was kidding. Uh, but speaking to the faction imbalancing, what we see on private services is that everyone sort of knows that like Alliance has a higher performance level in vanilla wow than yeah. Horde. well it's just like so, the average player iq for alliance is like higher yeah right <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's actually true and so you, you end up seeing like like a 60 40 split or 55 45 split you know alliance is dominant um uh player count wise but i think i think in classic wow it will be more 50 50 because i've noticed i i think that retail has more of a horde tilt um that's and like Oh, it's like heavy horde. Yeah. yeah. And so those people are going to spill over and want to play horde. Even like they, they might not know that Alliance is better. And so they'll spill over and play horde. Um, I think it, I th like we might even see a horde dominant classic. Well, who knows? Just because there'll be so many mm -hmm. new people that don't know about the meta. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think uh, Tips uh, is triggered. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere I go, dude, Alliance, everywhere I go. God damn. Are you going to Alliance, Nano? Uh, I'm Alliance for sure. God damn it! I mean, again, like I said, the we higher. About this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did, we did. He plays Wait. a female gnome warlock. Uh, mm -hmm. Male, male gnome. Male. Okay, male. that's fine. That's All right. Fine. It, oh, you do, right you too, you yeah, you two should go on a warlock date, maybe in game, in game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'll, meet, I'll meet you at Moonguard. No, well, I'll, yeah. I'll meet you. I'll meet you at the Tainted Scar. <laughs> what kind wow. of okay whoa uh, moving, moving that, was, faster. Good. that wow. was good dude that was that was good uh, you know what that was good uh okay so, <laughs> so uh this this is a fun question right the 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 necklace the um talisman of the binding shard would you like to see it drop would you like to see it drop in uh in classic like it's sure. like a because I, I know that's I, something you guys did, like only one drop and then it was yeah. and then it was done. Yeah. What do you guys think about this? It's it's so weird you ask this. I don't think it should drop. I think that should be a special vanilla wow meme. I don't think it should be replicated, but it's funny you ask this. The last couple nights I've actually had dreams. This is gonna sound super nerdy. I've had dreams <laughs> that I'm leading my guild in classic wow and it drops <laughs> and it causes a, a huge drama uproar and I have to deal with it. I've actually had dreams about that. Yeah. Just do so, it to yourself, it's fine. Just yeah. Take it. yeah, I'm sure that no, would cause drama. It's an inconsequential well, item. If if we wanted to drop for the, the memes, 
it's it's yeah. fine, but it's like reflect damage. So like maybe it's good for tanking whelps in this yeah. first room, and like. <laughs> well, I, I would say that the thing is, it, let's say they do have it in the game, um, like I think it's kind of obvious that it should go to a paladin, uh, specifically if you bring a red paladin to Ray. <laughs> so no, no, okay, listen. So it's it's got reflect damage, it's got strength and stamina, reflect damage. It synergizes very well with retribution aura. Uh, you've got nature resistance. Shamans are they counter paladins very well, so the nature resistance is good for that, and fire resistance as well. Um, I just want to say, you know what gets countered by paladins like really hard is warlocks. Uh, paladins actually counter warlocks very hard. Anyway, you can continue. What? Yeah, everyone knows that. All right. Well, okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> I have no problem with paladin. <laughs> I don't know I don't know. Dude, shut up, dude. <laughs> Uh, so for those of you guys who don't know, it, it's it's a running that's a running joke from uh, we did the classic demo and we were we were dueling on Stay Safe stream oh. and and Stay Safe and I happened to get pair up, paired up together and uh, I I ended up winning and it's just it's just a, it's just a meme it's just a running joke people are like what no they don't like what are you talking about <laughs> I was like no it's it's just a running joke there's all kind of, I mean yeah and we all know I mean that's one thing we should make clear that the classic WoW demo was a a hundred percent accurate right a hundred percent accurate and yep, I think yep. it was. A, a, a perfect representation, the epitome of yep. uh, skill, knowledge, overall attractiveness, uh, just social ability in general. So, <laughs> I, I mean, that's one thing that I think we all know uh, that's obviously true mm -hmm. and in no way exaggerated. 100%. So, yep. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh we'll, we'll take some questions in the chat as well uh if you guys have questions and, and you guys want to uh give us some questions in the chat before we wrap up um let's see here let's see uh do you think they will have the older enchant system in place at first where you had to get the dolls and the primal gear as opposed to the idols in cg the estimated time from stage four to five would be about three months and that's an extremely tight time frame if you want to enchant your whole raid team on idols yeah, I think what makes the I think what makes the most sense is that they're going to go with um, that they're, they're going to go with the it, it, like in stuff like that in general. I think it's going to be uh, the latest version, right? The the one point twelve version. Uh, I think yeah. that's what makes the most sense. I, I forget which one of you said it, but I, I think it might have been you or, uh, or Tips that said they'll probably run off of one twelve uh, with with exception, right? And not the other way around. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I mean the the pre one point uh, eleven version of getting ZG enchants is so non intuitive. It's like okay, let me go to Dire Mall to get this Arcanum, and then let me get this like purple item that's not actually for my class, um, so I can turn this doll in to get an enchant on my legs. Like it, it doesn't make that much sense. Um, so I. I, you get more enchants that way than you do with idols, um, so that's mm -hmm. why private servers have typically just kept it because it gives more people access to stuff, so they mm -hmm. don't complain. But um, I think the idol system is how it's going to work. Okay, so do you think do you think that going with the the, the system that you guys used, do you think that it would be a, a good idea? Maybe do you think that it would like if if they pick one one version over the other, do you think that it would be? Uh, I guess a good or bad idea, right? Let's say if, if they did it your guys' way. It's going to force people to run CG longer if you have the idle system, which okay. I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. Okay. It'll, help for, it'll help for those new players who uh, need the ZG catch-up gear, and every, all the healers have stopped going because they got Jendo's eye. Well, yeah. you, you, need, you need to keep going for the for the Hakar buff anyway, right? So you have to get that. Yeah. <clears throat> Are both the mount, mm -hmm. the yeah. PvP trinkets, Zandalar hero charm, stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. What about evolved underdogs? Enhance feral shadow, another hybrid. What do you mean another hybrid? What the hell? Okay. Anyway, you forgot Rep Paladin. You say my name, dude. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 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 you meant <laughs> <elemental> <laughs> Oh, okay, that's what it was. Yeah, no, we, we've talked enough about Rep Balan today. Yes. But uh, yeah, I, I think um, I think I think with the hybrids, uh, you know, we now have some chance to predict gear. So it can be said when power spikes come to the spec, come to the table. Yeah. So I, I think uh, the classic meta is going to be different. We said this earlier in the show. The classic meta is going to be different than the private server and the re the, the retail vanilla metas. They're all, they all have a little bit different metas. Uh, one of the things is 
uh, and, and I'll just talk about Shadow Priest for a second, is that they're, they're going to have 16 debuff slots from the beginning. And there, there's some, you know, it's, it's, some people say like, okay, well, in a 100% optimal raid, like you wouldn't have a Shadow Priest at all or whatever. And it's like, look, we're not always talking about the 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 one percenters, right? Or the point one percenters even. Um, I think Shadow Priests are, are, are a great addition to, to almost any raid. And uh, I know one thing that, that Stacey is probably freaking licking his chops thinking about is Warlocks are going to be very good in Classic. Just the, the combination of 1.12 talents from the beginning, uh, Warlocks having that from the beginning, or everybody having that from the beginning, and the fact that having 16 debuff slots available on the targets means that it's going to be more than viable. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be perfectly well, fine to bring a Shadow Priest to a raid from week one. You know, so, I... I, I wouldn't put it past them to do eight from the start like I, i'm not, i'm not sure what they're going to do still right they they very well could do eight early on maybe i maybe. i don't think i don't i just i don't know i i think at this point i i think they would they would it, hmm, i don't know i don't, they, I don't think it makes they, sense if they say they're gonna go to eight i'm gonna send ian a harshly worded email <laughs> <laughs> oh you, you don't want it i i actually i i'm a warlock right i would prefer eight uh for the start oh, you're you're just silly I got to corrupt. I got to get my shout out for these buddies. <laughs> yeah, so it'll it'll be it'll be interesting. I, I think with the 16 Devo slots from the beginning uh, that they're currently saying, I guess. Um, I think what hurts the Shadow I think Shadow Priest, Priest are going to be really good. Sorry, I, go ahead. I think what hurts the Shadow Priest the most at the start is just the lack of hit gear. Um, mm -hmm. Just no Bloodvine. Now we don't have Dire Maul. Uh, Dire Maul has a couple hit pieces, I'm pretty sure. Spellcast hit pieces, if I'm not mistaken. I think, um, but yeah, just like the overall lack of hit gear, is is not. Uh, yeah, yeah. As, as, uh, Shadow priests don't need that much hit gear because they have, yeah. um, they have ten percent plus hit from their talents, so they, they? only need, they yeah. only need six percent more. So and most of the time, get six and warlocks. Warlocks are the ones that really suffer. Whoever, yeah, warlocks I, are the most hit. hit I've already uh, complained yeah. to Kevin Jordan a lot about this. I don't know what he was thinking. We do <laughs> classes. He was out of his mind. Yeah. Man, can you imagine how good Warlocks would be with a plus ten percent hit talent? Oh man, dude! Think think of the threat problems. We are here, threat gap. Dude, <laughs> yeah. dude, Warlock threat. Yeah, I remember. So so, stay safe and I raided together for a little bit, and and what we would do, we we would plan this out. It's like okay, stay safe would like ride the line on threat. And I, I would be like, okay, like we're like we think there's like you know ten seconds left on a boss, and it's like okay, stay safe, go ham, like just start yep. spamming. And I would bop him, and he would go over cap on threat. And how blessing and protection works, and and just how the interactions work is, the boss attacks the guy with the highest threat, but if the guy with the highest threat is immune, then he won't go and and target him. So stay safe would ride the line on threat, and then I would bop him, and then he would go over the main tank on threat. But the boss would still be attacking the main tank because he's yeah. like, oh well, I'm not gonna go attack Stay Safe because he's immune. Yeah, right. So, right. and then, and then if the boss is still alive, you can out of it. yeah, exactly. You can live out of it if the boss is still up. But yeah, man, like yeah. You, you know, if you're playing a warlock in in classic, well, there's a lot of times where you want a DPS, but you're so close and you're you, you try <laughs> to squeeze in a shadow bolt and you're like, please don't crit, please don't crit, please don't crit. <laughs> if you crit, okay, we're gonna wipe the raid. Yeah, uh, uh, everybody hates you. Everybody yeah. hates you, dude. There, there was one time where I was, uh, I, I was the warlock leader, and I was, I would always yell at our dudes to not pull threat on Veil and, and Brute Lord because those are the like, two yep. ones where like, oh, like yeah. threat can really screw you. Yep. Um, and so we're doing Veil, and um, I cast corruption. I get like an early nightfall, so I was like, perfect, great. <laughs> and I got the PI, and I <laughs> double crit. My regular Shadow Bolt and my Nightfall did like 9,000 damage, pulled aggro. Veil <laughs> came to me, swiped me, I died. I think we still killed it, but uh, it was a pretty foot and mouth situation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I, I think I think it's going to be very fun. I, dude, I, I just like, I'm getting kind of like, just like flashbacks of different stuff with like Warlocks and just everybody. Like, every class has the stereotypes, right? There, there's you know warlocks who are always trying to pull threat, and then you have like hunters who are they they always forget to take their pet out, and you do the jump and won't corn, and they freaking wipe your raid, and it, it, dude, it, it's, there's always something right where it's just God hunters, yeah. they, okay. Anyway, so, like, there's always something, and dude, like, there's like a there, there was like a rat paladin, like somebody made like a little rat paladin meme early, and I was like, dude, this is perfect. All they had to do was put my just put my character model there, and this would be perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah Download all hunters who pull uh, extra CG packs with their pet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. 
So no, it's uh, it's just funny. Like certain, I, I don't know if it's like certain like uh, just personality types play those classes, or if it's like the nature of those classes cause you to make certain mistakes. Like who knows? But uh, chicken or the egg, I guess. Right. But yeah, it's 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 very fun thinking about all that stuff. So no, um, <clears throat> we had another question. This is a good question about like uh, uh, and and we'll, we'll take maybe one or, or two more questions. But um, this is a good question I saw earlier and I and I made a mental note of it is about gold selling and how people are or how how Blizzard is probably going to or how they should maybe look at um, what are what are they going to do to counteract gold sellers? Right? They they eventually in, in retail WoW made the WoW token. Uh, I don't foresee the WoW token being a thing in Classic. I think that's something that people have been very, very vocal about. Uh, we certainly have. And it, it's to the point where it's it's almost like it seems so ridiculous that it's like, okay, like obviously they're not going to do a WoW token. Like, it, that'd be absurd. Um, okay. But do you guys think they're going to come up with another way to um, so, counteract gold sellers? I, I think it's a good concern because gold botting and, and selling – like gold has a very gold is a very very formative part of your classical experience right because right. Uh, your success really depends on how much gold you have in a lot of cases um mm -hmm. with consumables and respects and and whatever and just buying your mounts and whatever for a lot of people that's a big deal you get your epic mount that's a big accomplishment for a lot of people um it, it was <laughs> yeah others we get it for free that's the way it goes um but uh it was, it was in one of their first uh, water cooler talks where they said they're going to be including updated anti-cheat and, uh, and anti-botting and, and like and, and, and so so their modern anti you know anti bad behavior software is going to be included, mm -hmm. which which is a, a big step up <clears throat> yeah you know? I mean right. there's still gold selling in retail today at you know, prices cheaper than you can get on the wow token I'm sure that there's less people who are willing to do that because the mm -hmm. wow token exists but there's still a market for it there's probably still going to be some market for it um on classic i doubt that they include that because um gold is a more um essential thing in classic than it is mm -hmm. in retail today like gold t today is mostly used for vanity things more than it is actual like necessary items to be accomplished and the idea of somebody just throwing down 105 dollars for five wow classic tokens so they can buy their epic mount is pretty anathema to the idea of classic in general so yeah. i would sincerely doubt that uh they add the wow tokens to the the classic right the classic yeah yeah i'm not uh, exactly sure how they go about detecting gold sellers today just because of the wow token I, I mean i don't like i i haven't seen a gold seller on kalthuzad or tachondrius in a while granted i haven't logged into retail in a while but like mm -hmm. um i i think you have to kind of deconstruct it from the private server perspective. There's a lot of gold sellers on private servers because number one, the accounts are free. Anybody can play on a right. private server. You don't need to pay $15 a month for it. Um, number two, because the server populations are so high that exacerbates the issue of gold because then inflation kicks in the economy big time. So you need more gold to buy consumables that might otherwise be cheaper if there was less gold in the economy. And again, mm -hmm. it, just, it creates this vicious cycle where, yeah, you know, buying gold is, you know, might be worthwhile on private servers. Um, it's still worthwhile on classic servers, but, you know, if you take into account, hopefully Blizzard's like, and, you know, not bot detection, but what would you even call this? Like spam detection and, yeah. and, uh, yeah. And well, like, dude, just, yeah. You, you want to know what it is. Every mm. time a gold seller pops up spamming trade chat in, in retail, wow, they get right click reported and muted. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> That's the yeah. one positive. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Um, yeah, I, I think gold selling, it's it's probably going to be a thing. I mean, it's just like, what, what are you going to do? I mean, hey, no changes. There, there was gold sellers back then, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, it's probably going to end up being a thing. I mean, people are going to be able to buy gold or whatever. I mean, uh, they'll get probably reported for it or whatever. I don't know. I, I, I don't I don't know what they're going to do to be able to, to, to counteract it. I think it'll be an interesting thing to see. But um, I'll, tell, I, I'll tell you this, man. If you're in my guild and I find out you bought gold, every person in my guild that's on my raid roster is an investment, right? Because we're giving them gear. Right. And so mm -hmm. if if someone is buying gold or doing something they shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. and risking a ban, that's a big deal, not just for them, but for the entire guild because we're, right. we're maybe giving them gear over someone else that isn't cheating or, or buying gold or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's a huge deal. I think what I'm going to do is if I find out somebody's buying gold, like let's say they buy 100 gold, I would come up with like a... Um, 
So, something that would be like a fair kind of like equivalent fine for buying 100 gold. Uh, and they would pay, let's say, 100 gold uh, if they bought 100 gold to me. Uh, and then, you know, that way if they get banned, then at least the gold that they bought is safe. So that, that's the way that I see it. <laughs> no, no, I'm just and kidding. Blizzard bans you. <laughs> yeah, because they think I bought from him. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Great yeah, plan. No. <laughs> Great plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, uh, let's take. Oh, you, you want to go ahead? I, I have one last question here. Just trying to last well, chance that gold wander. <laughs> hey, the Persians well, are great negotiators. What can I say? <laughs> well, well, kind of like going off what Stacy just said about investing into a person. Mm -hmm. um, a big thing in vanilla is people people quitting the game, and oh, uh, yeah. you you invest a lot of time and gold and gear into certain players, a gear that doesn't drop very often, and then they quit. What do you think about the account sharing stuff? Like, like right now, like on ND, right? If, if somebody quits in the guild that I'm in, their account goes to the guild and, you know, people do whatever they need to do uh, with something like that. I mean, I, I would assume it would be against Blizzard policy right now, but... Oh, it is. 100% it is. It is. And it's it, also it, much yeah. harder. It will, and it should mm -hmm. remain against policy. Yeah. I think that's best. It, it's actually funny you bring that up. Going back to the Talisman of Binding Shard hypothetical drop, that's a, okay. I actually decided that I would take it because I know that I'm not going to quit, and it's such a rare item. Mm -hmm. So just that mm -hmm. anyway. Solved. True, true. Yeah. Solved. That was a, that was a big problem. That was a big problem I had in, in uh, uh, my last guild. Like whenever we were doing loot council stuff, like we we would give stuff out, and I, like I always try to be like you know a, a, as as fair as possible. And I think one thing that I learned is is being as fair as possible is not necessarily distributing the loot as evenly as possible, right? Because what's fair is uh, that the guild keeps the loot at the end of the day. So like we would end up like losing out pieces of gear uh, to people, you know, like I said, we lost, we ended up losing like five DFTs, right? Um, Oof. Yeah, it was, it was rough. So like, it's just like, we, we gave it to one guy, he, uh, Drake, Drake Fang Talisman. I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, uh, no, no, it was good. Cause it, cause some people might not know. Like I thought you were, I my, thought that's what you were asking. That. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 No, that's how we were like for a while. Uh, cause we got, we finally got one. We gave it to a guy, and then he ended up quitting like two weeks later. And then uh, it was just kind of like the same thing. We didn't get one forever, and then we got some, and it's just, it's just how it goes. Um, were these so people yeah, that were you, quitting, or were they leaving guild and going to different guilds? Uh, mostly quitting. Okay. But that's, that's that's also part of the private server thing, right? So like Tips, yeah. you mentioned like people quitting. That's that's a lot of that has to do with private server because they jump ship and they they go play on a different server or or whatnot. And like like I said, I I really only have like my my original character that I played on back before like one of our streaming on YouTube. But um, that that is how it worked, right? People would quit and they'd go play on another private server or uh they wouldn't really have they wouldn't feel as invested into it because it was exactly. free right yeah, exactly. so like they're just like oh whatever like, I'll quit or like they would do something and get banned they're like oh whatever I'll just make another account. It wasn't it wasn't as big of a deal on private servers, and I think it's going to be a little bit of, of a bigger deal on uh, in, in in classic. It's much harder to account share in in today's system of accounts anyway, in terms of Blizzard, right? It's like everything is tied mm -hmm. together in the the B.net account system, where like my license for StarCraft Two and Overwatch and you know yeah. everything else is tied with my my same account that i use for wow so the idea and and with 2fa like being necessary like the authenticator like mm -hmm. it's just really difficult to account share like and and i mean i i would imagine i don't know but i would imagine that if you log in from california one day in the new york you know three hours later and then back in california four hours later that probably trips a red flag or something right like right. I, I would imagine that so mm -hmm. i mean i've not i haven't shared uh, an account with somebody that wasn't in vanilla like ever like it's because mm -hmm. like once they came up with a new bnet system it's just like it's just not practical right yeah. again again yeah no that's true that's a good point um one last thing we want to get to and we kind of uh, fox tango has asked this a couple times and uh we we kind of talked about this earlier right whenever we were talking about itemization and whatnot uh he was asking about um should we assume they will pro uh, progress item changes uh, or they will progress item changes, or that they will import 1.8 to 1.12 data items. Uh, how are these types of items handled for NOST? Uh, and and that's that's kind of the big question, right? Just to address this one more time, because we talked about this earlier, but um, that is that is the big question right now: is do they want to? Uh, how 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 much 
of progressive itemization are they going to implement into the game, right? Because they've talked about adding in new items later on. Uh, I mean, they might have just been using the 1.10 as an example, right? That's what I think. I'm sure they're going to um, – it's not just going to be the 1.10 patch items, but that's like the big chunk, and it's easy to talk about that in a post because, uh, you know, there's not like, you know, turbo nerds like us, right, that we're, we're going to look at every little thing. Um, but I'm assuming that when it comes to adding items into the game, that's one side of progressive itemization. Another side of it is updating items. Uh, I think when it comes to adding items, they're probably going to put them in at the right time. Uh, whenever it comes to updating items, who knows? That's that's the question. I think uh, I think it's it's maybe less likely. So what do you guys think? Uh, in terms of the dungeons, there's two different times where they really added a lot of items to the dungeons themselves so mm -hmm. 1.4 also adds a lot of items to five-man dungeons like uh like your felt uh, uh something hat the the wizard hat that drops off magistrate it gets added oh, yeah. 1.4 uh yeah. maliki's slippers for the shadow damage um, boots those kind of things like there's that, a lot of things the one the one is gone get added i think as well at yeah. that point yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of items that get added to five man dungeons in 1.4 and 1.10 is when they make really good items to compete and to catch people up for being able to do AQ. Um, so whether they do the 1.4 ones um, is hard to say. Um, 1.4 would be phase two with Dire Maul. Uh, based on what they're saying with Dire Maul, it might make sense for them to hold back some of those items because they, they can be good and compete with some other items that you find in, in MC. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, I think it'd be good if they did do that. Because again, I'm in favor of anything that makes raid items better, more powerful than dungeon items I'm typically in favor of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, I, I think there is, I think that's one of the interesting things of vanilla, right? Where that you can have some items in dungeons that'll, that'll be on par to kind of like help players get into, the, get into raids and stuff. And maybe, you know, we've talked about this before. So much of vanilla might've just like been on accident. Right. And you know, whenever we talked to John stats, uh, and really we talked to, we've talked to Mark Curran, we talked to John stats, we talked to Kevin Jordan. Uh, all those guys said things that are just kind of like, yeah, we just kind of did this thing and it worked. So like a lot of it was planned, but also a lot of it was kind of on, on accident, you know? Um, and it's funny just because you never know like what things were uh well you, you don't know what was what right you don't know okay was this did they do this on purpose and did it just turn out to be amazing or you know right. um but yeah guys we've been going for for quite some time a yeah. uh, little bit a little bit over time so we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up guys thank you so much for joining us today please 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 if you haven't yet please feel free to follow uh follow nost or follow nano nost follow stay safe tv follow tips out baby on twitch uh also their youtube channels their twitter everything's on the everything's on the screen right there uh my twitter my youtube is on the screen uh you know remember to hit the bell all that stuff thank you guys for joining us we do classic cast uh roughly every two weeks right you know on, on monday nights this week we changed it on to tuesday night uh for some scheduling stuff tips is going to be continuing his stream tips is going to be continuing his stream after this and uh, i will host tips um and yeah, you can uh, you can hit their links right there in the chat, exclamation point follow. You can hit their links. So uh, again, thank you guys so much. We had a great time with you guys today. I thought this was a really fun episode. And uh, we'll see you guys later. See you guys. Peace. Take care.